Mayor Satterthwaite. Here we have a quorum. Uh, the first item on our agenda this evening is approval of the minutes of the previous meeting. Uh, is there a motion? Move approval. Second. Have a motion, a second. Any discussion, additions, or corrections? Yes, Ms. Wyman. Just a couple of typos, um, just for the record. On page four, uh, third paragraph from the bottom, the paragraph begins, Economic Development Manager John Reggett's read a proclamation from the Department of Agriculture Office of, Secre Office of the Secretary commemorating National Farmers. There should be in inserted after Farmers Market Week, August 1 through 7, 2004. Um, and page eight, last line, uh, it reports five, voting aye rather than six, so just to correct it as six. That's all, thank you. Okay, any other additions or corrections? Not any discussion? There's no discussion. All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion carries. Um, additions or corrections to the agenda? I've got a couple. Um, notice uh, uh, Mr. Otto is not here this evening. He just uh, uh, called the clerk's office a few moments ago and informed them the close uh, high school friend of his passed away and he's dealing with that situation and has asked that uh, item A under the uh, committee of the report, the ordinance uh, regarding uh, employee ethics and political activity be postponed for two weeks. Is there any objection to honoring that request? Okay. And uh, you'll see on the agenda that uh, staff was uh, requesting a two-week postponement on item D, the uh, home consortium uh, agreement. Is there any objection to that? Okay, we'll see both of those in two weeks then. Uh, any other additions or corrections to the agenda this evening? Okay, if not, uh, we'll go to uh, petitions and communications. If there's anybody in the audience that would like to speak to the council for a period of no more than five minutes. Uh, fill out one of these white cards at the back and bring it up to me or the clerk and uh, you'll have the chance to do so. Uh, before we get started with these though, uh, we have a presentation to make. As you know, our Sweet Corn Festival is coming up in uh, less than two weeks time and we had a promotional, uh, promotional uh, sweet corn eating contest uh, over the weekend of which I and Chief Adair among uh, others were participants um, but we were all outshined by the, the um, champion sweet corn eater uh, Ms. Wyman uh, was there and in a multi-round competition uh, in fact, uh, went to sudden death, yeah. <laughs> and she, sure she, after, like after two rounds and a sudden, sudden death round, she was the uh, the victor in the sweet corn eating contest. And I know she got many valuable prizes at the time, but we have another prize for her. Uh, and so she, uh, <laughs> our uh, our resident cornhead for her. Being like the sweet corn eating champion. <laughs> well, I have many hidden talents, and now another has been discovered. <laughs> yeah, that's a talent that's not hidden anymore. <laughs> Thank you. Well, first uh, we have uh, Joe Petrie and Ray Timponi Jr. Uh, Ray Timponi Sr. is here as well. Uh, they're going to make a presentation on the Stratford project. Uh, this is uh, at, uh, I think it's what, 106 North Ray Street. And um, so they have a proposal for a TIF development and they've got a PowerPoint presentation. Who's going to kick that off? Thank you, Mr. Mayor. It's a pleasure to be here with you. We're very excited about what we're going to talk to you about tonight. I know we've only got five minutes, so we'll be brief. Um, we are proposing uh, and would uh, like to get your support on a $5 million, uh, 53,000 square foot project, new construction, brick and limestone building at the corner of Race and Water Streets in downtown Urbana. <clears throat> I want to walk you through that briefly. First of all, let me introduce the rest of our team. We have Ray Timponi, Jr. I'm Joe Petrie. Uh, we also have Ray Timponi, Sr. Uh, and Andrew Fell uh, and a number of other uh, important partners that uh, aren't here tonight but are friends 
Marianne Pankow in particular at BC Bank has been particularly helpful, as well as the rest of the BC team. Pat Fitzgerald will be helping us on the legal side, and Ramshaw Realty will be helping us to rent out the units and to lease the commercial space. It takes a lot of things for these kinds of things, this kind of development, to come to fruition. And we're of the belief that these things are beginning to happen at this point in downtown Urbana. And I guess the things that I would point out are, first of all, and to your credit, the city of Urbana, the city staff, and the city council have been extremely supportive. And I can't stress to you enough the importance of that consistency over time that observers such as myself and Ray Timponi have seen. And that has made believers out of us, and we look forward to seeing a lot of good things for downtown Urbana. So certainly the vision and leadership of the council, and we've had the great pleasure to work with Bruce Walden, John Reggett, Libby, and a number of other people, Rob, and I'm going to forget some people, Ryan, were all very helpful in helping us get this project off the ground and in front of you to take a look at. In addition to your own leadership, we think actually, and we're going to play off some of the successes in our neighboring city of Champaign. They've had some successes. They also have some issues that have come up. For better or for worse, there's a reputation in Champaign, downtown Champaign, of kind of a bar scene. There is a need and a strong desire to have an alternative to that. The congestion in downtown Urbana is also an issue. The reputation that Urbana has of being very inclusive of the terrific history we have here and the openness to a variety of different viewpoints is very, very important to us. What we see as kind of the niche for downtown Urbana and for Urbana more generally that we want to play to really would include, first of all, restaurants, which, as you know, most of the best restaurants in the community are located in Urbana, many of them in downtown Urbana. That is clearly already a leadership position. A lot of high-tech firms, and sometimes you don't even realize it as somebody from outside of Urbana may not even recognize just how many high-tech firms are already located in downtown Urbana. That would include firms like OJC, Volo, a number of other firms that are located in the downtown. In addition, it's a very strong artist-friendly component. So if I were Richard Florida and if I were looking for a community to model his idea of what a good community is, I would pick Urbana, Illinois. We think that's a great opportunity, offers a great opportunity for a luxury apartment and office complex. We are proposing a 53,000-square-foot new building would be brick and limestone. There would be a combination of apartments and office. We would have 41 luxury apartments, most of those two-bedroom, a smattering of those one-bedroom, all upscale, in addition to some office space on the first floor. And with that office space, right now we've got a lot of 3,700 square feet. That might increase a little bit. In any case, what we're targeting there is a high-tech firm, which we already have some leads on. A number of firms have approached us, actually, and are interested in locating downtown Urbana, so we're discussing that with them. We're also going to have secure on-site parking, 68 spots for that. We would begin, with your permission, we will begin this project immediately. We would have our architecture team and other components of the team effectively start full-time tomorrow morning. Once you give us the go-ahead, we would expect to break ground October 1st. The objective would be to have this ready for occupancy August 1st of next year. That is, as I mentioned, just about $5 million. The actual project size would be $4.65 million, is our current estimate. This is the west elevation of the proposed building. You are looking at it from Ray Street. In the far right corner, that would be fronting Water Street. In fact, you see there, there's three stories above grade. The first story there would be where we'd have the office component. If I can use this thing. So in here would be the office component. The remainder of this area here would be your entryway to the apartments. You'd have the elevator core there. This is the first floor. So again, here's the office component. This is the 3,700 square feet for office. You see the nice 
frontage, which perhaps you could have seen just as easily in the previous slide. That's a nice metal awning there. So you're looking down at this and you're seeing on that floor you're going to see all two-bedroom apartments. Here's your elevator core, your double entry doors, mail room, et cetera. This is just upper floors, three and four. They're virtually going to be identical. We have a number of one-bedroom apartments over on this side and one bedroom here. Otherwise, it's two-bedroom apartments. This is a typical floor plan. We're not going to scrunch people into these apartments. We've looked at other apartments available in downtown Urbana and downtown Champaign, and we've scaled them up from there both in quality and in size. This is 850 square feet, an example of a typical two-bedroom. Things that are going to be included here that you might not expect in some apartments are going to be ceramic tile, full-size washer and dryer included, oversized windows, nice amenities. We hope and we expect that this will be the first phase of a multi-phase project. We would like to, upon successful completion of phase one, talk with you about going on to phase two and three. I've outlined that very briefly, and I'll show you a diagram with the basics of those two phases in just a second. It would be a combination, again, of residential and office. Phase two would be a four-story residential building just to the north of the site that we're looking at now, and I'll point that out in a second. That would be 24 units, 24,600 square feet. And then just to the east, which would be, I guess, just north of the Jolly Roger, we would do phase three. That would be a combined three floors of residential and office. First floor would be office, and then two floors above that would be residential. So here's phase one. So this is the building that I showed you the elevation of initially. Notice its southernmost edge there is on Water Street. It extends north along Ray Street. So we've got the office down here at this corner, and then apartments in the remainder. We've tried to hide the parking to the greatest extent possible. It's behind the building. We have secure gates at both entrances. So that's phase one. And just for context, here's the Jolly Roger restaurant right here. This, then going north, would be phase two. Again, that's in the neighborhood of, and I'm estimating here, about $2.8 million project residential. This is the boneyard right here. And, in fact, that's one important aspect of something that we really want to work with the city council on, and that is turning that area into a nice amenity. It has a great deal of potential, and we'd love to see it. That, then, is phase two, and then phase three is right along here. Mayor, you may recognize this location. This is Todd and John's restaurant. And then this would be that new building along with an existing building that we would build on top of, and that would be phase three. And we're open for whatever questions you might have. Okay, any questions? Yes, Ms. Wyman. On some of the office space that you've identified, if someone wanted to turn that or use it during, well, if someone would like to use that for business, for retail, is that something that would be compatible? Sure. We'd love that. That is either office or retail. Okay. And one other question about the residential component. Are any of those units planned to be accessible? I noticed you've got some stairs, and I'm wondering if there are entrances so people with mobility impairments would be able to enter and exit. Sure. If we went back to the early diagrams, you'd see that there's an accessibility, ADA accessible area here into the commercial, and then down on this end it's all completely ADA accessible. And so how many of the apartments or what percentage would be accessible? Essentially all of them. Great. Thank you. Any other questions at this point? Okay. Well, this will come up later in the agenda, and, of course, we'll look forward to the discussion then. And if you guys want to answer any questions at that time, too, feel free. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, sure. Mr. Whalen? Yeah. Ray, hi. Jim, can you tell me who did you work with on staff and within the administration to come up to this point? 
We worked with Bruce and with Rob and with Libby and uh, a lot of the economic development team. John was important, uh, and we've you know we've been in indirect contact with the mayor. Oh, that's certainly wonderful. That's the kind of thing we need. We need to bring business to downtown Urbana. That's and we're two guys that believe in downtown Urbana. We think that there's a lot of amenities in downtown Urbana. The new library, the post office in downtown, the, the grocery stores that are available down there, the bus lines. So we believe in Urbana, and we think there's a lot of potential down there. We need to bring some business. We think this will get a jump started. I appreciate the answer. This is a different kind of city and we can all be very proud of it. We've been very impressed and very pleased with cooperation. Thank you. Okay, well, if there are no more questions, thanks for the presentation. It uh, looks exciting, and we'll get to it later on in the agenda. Um, next is uh, Curtis Pettyjohn, 907 South Orchard on the MOR, Mixed Office Residential um, Guidelines for the Design Review <coughs> Board. Good evening. Um, it's been, I guess, about a year since the ball started rolling on the MOR district. Um, a lot of people came to the council with concern initially. City staff has been working many, many hours on this. The guidelines, I feel, that have been created are wonderful, but I have grave concerns at this point that the enforcement of the guidelines is not there. The taking away of the enforcement and offering them as suggestions to me is like training a guard dog and then removing its teeth and hoping that your place will be safe. Um, I, at this point, am maybe unclear as to how we're going to proceed with this, but I'm hopeful that the guidelines will be put in place and will be put in place that they have to be adhered to, not simply offered as some sort of menu. Um, and it, my feeling is, is if they're not enforced, if they're not put in place and enforced, that we truly have spent a lot of time for possibly not much effect. And so I ask that you truly consider that as we move forward. Okay, thank you. Any questions? Yes, Ms. Wyman. I don't want to make this meeting um, too long because I know we're already, it's already going to run pretty long, but I was just wondering if you could answer, are there specific uh, issues that you want to make sure are made mandatory rather than just strongly recommended or recommended? Um, entrances concern me. Uh, as, as we saw with the property that's been developed by Dave Barr, which is, is finished at this point, um, the initial design that came forward had no entrances on Green Street and uh, that changed with city staff working with the developer and uh, I'm truly grateful that that happened because what we've ended up with is a beautiful building but I can't believe that every developer is going to be as um, forthcoming and uh, I think that it makes a huge difference as to where the entrances are um, and the effect that it has on street life. Thank you. Any other questions? Okay, thank you. Thank you. Uh, next is Elona Matkowski, 412 West Elm, on the MOR revisions. Hi, I basically would like to repeat what Mr. Pettyjohn has just said. I'm concerned that if uh, these uh, guidelines will be just recommendations and not requirements, not many developers will pay much attention to them because I'm afraid they will think that um, it's easier, maybe cheaper, to just go the way they want to go. Um, and I'm afraid that without enforcing the guidelines or making them requirements, um, we're going to end up with very ugly buildings like we have been seeing uh, built in the Moore District in the last 20 or 30 years. Uh, I would like to actually know more specifics about the changes that the 
planning board um, wants to make? What are those issues that they are? Um, is it the entire pact, that package well, that we came up with, or certain points I, of it? Maybe I should have given you the option of uh, speaking now or at the time of the um, at the time of the agenda item, because you do have the option of speaking after you've heard the staff presentation, yeah. and that might clear up some of your questions. Might yeah. prompt a few more questions. Who knows? But yeah. would you like to do that? Would you like to? Uh, Wait until the agenda item comes up, and then I yeah. can call you back again and uh, yeah. after the staff report. Yeah, basically, I, I just would like to say what I already said, that I worry that this may not have any teeth if <laughs> okay. they will be just recommendations. Okay, thank you. Thanks. Uh, next is uh, Lester and Barb uh, Pritchard, 601 West Pennsylvania. I guess, did you want to speak now or at the time of the agenda thank item? You. Speak now, okay. for Lester so you all understand we're here tonight to talk about one aspect of the MOR district um, the the parking within the footprint of the building and um, this issue came up seven years ago and there was a big debate about whether to allow the citywide at that time this issue actually came up several years ago, and there was a big debate whether or not to allow this citywide at that time. Um, first of all, let me distribute some photographs. It then said the pictures speak a thousand words. So I'm going to have my assistant distribute these pictures to you. First of all, let me distribute some pictures to you. I'm going to have my assistant distribute some pictures. And it's been said that pictures speak a thousand words. <coughs> this picture is of two apartment on the ground of what one of these green. This picture is actually two different pictures of two apartments at the corner of Busey and Green. Um, as you can see, the two apartments and the only two apartments in the Grand Noble. <coughs> 
to the parking garage. As you can see, there are two apartments and only two apartments on the ground level, and they're adjacent to the garage. Uh, the one in Italy, you put the trash can is trying to get to the door. The one amenity is that the trash can is right next to the door. <laughs> um, Bob and I have taken the opportunity to listen to the, the, um, meeting of the planning commission. And we were impressed that the planning commission and in great detail about the, <coughs> about the appearance of the heat of the authorities. Barb and I took the opportunity to listen to the plan commission meeting and we were impressed by the great deal that the, in the great detail that the plan commission went into about looking at the facade of each of these of each of the buildings. The discussions were very thoughtful and very detailed. The discussions were very thoughtful and very detailed. There was again the missing however was how these people how these facilities would be used. The one element that was missing, however, was how these facilities would be used. Uh, People live in apartments. People live in apartments. Yeah, they should be designed around uh, functioning of people. And they should be designed around the functioning of people. People, whether they be black or white, gay or straight, or disabled or able. People, whether they be black or white, gay or straight, disabled or able. Um, I am, on September 8, 1997, you passed a resolution that will pass out. Now, the second city staff to work with the disability community to Consider a proposal to make the second floor apartment of apartment building acceptable. When <coughs> the, the parking occupies a portion of the ground floor and <coughs> it needs the building. On September 8th, 1997, um, you passed a, an agreement. An ordinance. an ordinance that directed the city staff to work with the disability community um, to make the the groom thank you Linda. to make the second floor usable by people with disabilities when the ground floor <laughs> is occupied partially by parking and Lester I don't think that was an exact quote I'm sorry yeah, good job. And Lester just passed out that that ordinance. To our knowledge, no discussion has ever been point. Ever been to your point. To our knowledge, no discussion between the staff and the disability community has never taken has ever <coughs> taken place. For your proposal tonight, did you consider um, discussing the issue of more detail? with the disability community and seeing if there's a way to make, make both sides uh, come to agreement on the issue. What I'm proposing tonight is that you take more time and discuss this issue between um, the dis with the disability community and come to an agreement that will work for both sides on this issue. Bob and I talk with Mr. Otto this past week. He told us and many um, 
abandon Arnold, who are building new facilities are putting in elevators because they command the higher rent. Barb and I talked with Mr. Otto this week, and he told us that many developers are putting in elevators be, um, many times because they demand a higher rate. And if I can add, these were elevators in buildings that didn't, the law didn't require elevators because he said that was an added amenity. And uh, the second thing that we are proposing is that you consider developing a plan to increase accessible uh, 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 housing in the bed. The second thing we are proposing is that you consider developing a plan that would increase accessible housing in Urbana. That way we will be able to be coming forth and, and discussing each item bit by bit that there will be over a point that we can go by. That way we won't have to be coming forward to you and discussing each t item bit by bit. There will be an overall plan that we could all go by. And that, that will Basically, all I have to say, thank you. Unless you said that's basically all I have to say, thank you. And I have no more comments either. Thank you. Okay. Any questions? Um, Ms. Pat? Thank you. I just have one. Um, do you know the locations of any of these buildings that have elevators that don't need them? Uh, Mr. W w wake one. Um, was the one who made the comment to Milton. Uh, Mr. Wakeling was the one that made the comment to Milton. I believe he was on the side street by the old uh, You believe it was on the side street by the old? Uh, uh, the, Food bank, by the, the one yeah, by the food, food bank food that he yeah. built? Is that yeah, that's true. Yes, yeah, by the food bank. Uh, what? But, uh, but I don't know. Uh, uh, but, I know but I don't know. Okay. Thank you. Wyman? Just in response to that, I the new building that Wakeland's building uh, is on the same street that um, where I live, and so I go by it a couple times a week. I haven't noticed anything that shows any sort of elevator on it, although it's still under development. So if you talk with them again and someone, if, and they, they said that there are going to be elevators, I, I'd be interested in finding out because I'm not aware of any, uh, Ms. Pat and I were talking, I don't think we're aware of any landlords or any properties that are putting in elevators that, aren't, that don't require it. So it would be interesting to find out if that's, if that's fact or fiction. Thanks. You're getting, you're getting knowledge. Yeah. That's just, you're getting second-hand knowledge here. Thank you. Yeah. Okay, any other questions? Okay, thank you. And uh, Lester, we'd like to congratulate you on your appointment to uh, the state uh, board that you've just agreed to join. And uh, I want to thank you uh, also in, in person for the many years you served on the Human Relations Commission. So thanks for all your involvement. Thank you very much. Um, it will indeed be a challenge, but. Um, the opportunity that the mayor of the city has afforded me over the past 18 years has given me a bit, a good base to operate from. Lester said thank you. It will definitely be a challenge, but the city and the mayor have given me a good opportunity for the past 18 years with a good base to operate from. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Uh, next, we have uh, Steve Ross at uh, 609 West Green on the topic of the MOR.
Good evening. Um, my name is Steve Ross. I'm, as uh, the mayor said, at 609 West Green. Um, I'm sure you all know that there were two components in the change to the MOR. The first one was a, uh, a change in the membership, the composition of the, of the Development Review Board, uh, going from city staff to citizen and, and uh, resident membership. And I'd just like to thank uh, the mayor for his uh, recommendations based on the three people that I know, Mr. Zangler, Ms. Gashow, and Mr. Adams. I think those are um, wonderful recommendations. The other uh, aspect was is the design guidelines. The, it's been the focus of other comments uh, tonight, and it's also the focus of my brief comments. I think the city staff has done a great job in, in putting these together. And uh, I know there's people that have said that it can't be done. Um, but I think as I read through them, uh, it, it can be done. And uh, I'm hopeful that we can, can show it in action. Um, my only concern tonight is that uh, uh, any project that is built in the MOR, I hope will substantially satisfy the requirements of the, uh, the design guidelines. I think the Development Review Board needs some um, concrete goals by which to evaluate a proposed project. Um, so that we ensure that it meets all the major requirements which are noted as strongly encouraged in the design guidelines and uh, at least a, a substantial subset of the minor requirements. Um, I can think of uh, one major requirement that I wish had been in place um, a year ago when uh, 605 West Green, my neighbor, uh, when that project was approved, um, because that uh, project does not have an entrance on the front, so all the traffic, all the foot traffic, will be from the parking lot in the back, down the side of the building, but next to my house, up an external stairway, and uh, and then into the apartments. Which is all this action is taking place in front of my 12-year-old daughter's bedroom. So I'm not really uh, excited about that project. I think if it had a front door we would, and a back door, we, would, we could avoid that sort of thing, much as Mr. Barr has done at 611 West Green. Um, and speaking of Mr. Barr, he uh, has appeared, uh, I think it was before the Development Review Board, and said that uh, he would like to know in concrete terms what he needs to do. And that would have saved him some time and effort. Um, and I think we can help him and the members of the Development Review Board uh, by being very clear on on what requirements need to be met for any project in the MOR district. Thank you. Okay, any questions for Mr. Ross? Questions? Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, any other petitions or communications from members of the public? Uh, yeah. Gabe, do you want to throw out a card? Or? Yeah, yeah. All right. You can fill that out, Gabe, after you're done. Okay. Just go ahead. Well, um, Gabe Omosagi, 2409 North High Cross. Um, just once again, um, trying to talk about uh, the um, petition drive and things like that to try to at least get two at large members on the council. Um, I don't know why major, majority of the council are opposed to it. Um, it's citywide. Um, I'm tired of reading about it in the papers and uh, people saying that um, it's, it makes, it, it, it would not make room for minorities. I don't know what that means. All minorities don't have this, uh, the same point of view. You know, I would, uh, you know, I mean, I don't know what they're afraid of. Let the petition go, drive go forward and let's have uh, um, the election and let's see what happens. I think that, you know, from my point of view, the council needs a lot of help. Um, yeah, I mean, like I said before, you know, you have four people who always vote the same way and uh, unfortunately, <laughs> Jim Hayes, you joined them to override the mayor's veto the last time. I don't understand. I don't know why. Maybe you you can explain it to me. Uh, every time I come in here, I know that uh, uh, for some reason uh, people just uh, stare at me, and uh, 
I wonder if it's that uh, you, you, you're not sure whether I know what I'm talking about or you know, you're afraid of uh, arguments. You know, I think, uh, you know, I, I love fierce contentions. You know, I would love to uh, debate anybody on these subjects. Um, you know, I do, I'm tired of people hiding behind the idea that they are for minorities. You know, just forget that. You're not for, you know, I don't think that you're more sensitive to minorities than the mayor is. You know, and for some reason, at least I respect the mayor's position a lot better than most of the other people on the council, in the sense that at least the mayor has done something else before becoming a politician. You know, he's run a business, at least. You know, that's, to me, you know, um, when you, before you start making laws for everybody to follow, you must at least have lived in the real world, you know, uh, have an idea about it. You know, I remember, um, I think it was uh, Hubert Humphrey who uh, uh, long ago said, uh, when, he f when he got out into the real world and bought some hotels, you know, and then finally the hotels went under. And then he said, you know, you know what put those hotels under? The laws that I passed when I was in, in Congress. You know, he said, if I had known what I know now, I would not have passed those laws. And the same thing, you know, with uh, there are people who have spent all their time and all their lives being activists, you know, sitting there and telling us what's good for the majority of the people without having any idea as to what the uh, way in the real world uh, have to put up with. So, of course, let the um, election go. They have over a thousand signatures like, uh, right now. Don't fight it. I'm sure it's going to be a Democrat. You know, you say it will be, uh, you know, what would happen is that the Democrat would be uh, in, in the pockets of big business. Don't make me laugh. What big business in a banner? You know, <laughs> look, you know, let it go forward. Let's see what happens. You know, we need uh, some new ideas. You know, uh, I guess you're progressives. Let's get some new ideas. Thank you. Questions? There will be no questions, I'm sure. <laughs> okay, thank you. <laughs> if you want to fill out your card and then sure. give it to um, Phyllis. Um, any other petitions and communications from members of the public? From council members? Yes, Mr. Whalen? Uh, <clears throat> to um, uh, follow Steve and his uh, appeal, I would just say uh, it would seem to me to be wise. I have learned a lot from you folks. Uh, and that's, we have different opinions, but I have certainly learned quite a bit uh, from your generosity and your thoughtfulness and uh, interest in uh, minorities. And, uh, and I thank God for that because that's where I came from when I graduated from college. But I must say, uh, I think it would be wiser for this council to get behind this drive for a larger council and say, you know, maybe they've got an idea here and get behind it so that the, uh, it doesn't look like this such a great contrast. <clears throat> and so I would urge you to give this some thought and perhaps in the next time that we have to speak to the public, say, you know, I think they're right. I think we do need more uh, open-mindedness here. And that <clears throat> certainly, we, we all recognize the criticism of political power, and that is uh, some perceived by some to be a valid criticism. But at the same time, you know, what does being liberal mean? Being liberal means being open-minded, and willing to consider different ideas. And I think, I think that that would be uh, a great feather in the cap of our, uh, not an endangered species, mind you, but uh, in the feather of the cap of our seeming uh, majority on the city council. Say, let's get behind this. By golly, this, is, this makes some sense. We're with it, and you know that the <clears throat> possibility and the probability of having a Democrat elected is quite feasible. So, you know, look good in the eyes of the public here. 
don't look like you're trying to just hold on to some small bit of power. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, any other petitions and communications from council members? Okay. Um, yes, Mr. Hayes. I just want to announce that uh, Thursday, August 19th, there's going to be an Ease at Lincoln celebration from 5 to 7 p.m. And uh, it'll take place on the corner of Ease and, and Gregory Street. And also, uh, they're going to talk about uh, people who are interested in buying homes. You can get the information at this particular time. So Thursday, August 19th from 5 to 7 p.m. Okay, thank you, Mr. Hayes. Uh, next, we uh, have reports from the Standing Committee, the Committee of the Whole, since there's no old business. Thank you. Uh, starting with item 1A has been sent to the September 7th uh, council meeting. So go to item B. Uh, council members would have found the memo in our packet dated August 13th, which is the summary of all that was uh, included in the decision at committee, but there are some blanks left in the ordinance that I'm about to move. Ordinance number 2004-06068, an ordinance amending the City of Urbana Code of Ordinances, curfew for minors. For the committee, I so move. Second. We have a motion and a second. Any discussion? Uh, yes. Uh, because there were some uh, blanks left um, by, by Mr. Holt so that council could fill it in as, as we saw fit, which I appreciate, um, I'd like to now move um, these changes on page three of the strikeout version, item E. Maximum fine for a violation of this section shall be $75, if I understand that correctly, to be after an accumulation of, of several uh, violations. And under section two, directly under that, uh, violation, uh, section 15-63A, violations by minors, first offense, 25, second offense, 50, third offense, 75, uh, and s the same repeat for the item below that, violations by parents, guardians, etc. Uh, and as I understand that to be a maximum, um, so up to those figures of 25, 50, and 75, and then also I'd like to move a type, uh, just a correction of a typo on page two at the bottom uh, of the page, item five, strike out the words the juvenile so it reads simply number five is homeless uh, that just corrects a, um, a linguistic error thank you second we have a motion a second any discussion yes Ms. Chandler the, the motion on the floor is the to amend the the motion is that correct I'll, I'll hold off my uh, my comments at this point so the effect of this would be actually to leave the first offense the same as it is right now, leave the second offense the same as it is right now, and to lower the amount for the third offense, which is currently a minimum of 100 and maximum of 200 to uh, between 50 and 75. Is that, am I reading that right? Is that what the effect of this would be, Mr. Holtz? Okay. That's how I heard it. Mm -hmm. it's, um, not, it's not my re recommendation. That's Ms. Wyman's recommendation. Right, but I was mine just had blanks. That's your intent is to lower the uh, um, curfew third offense. Yes, and and actually, if I could clarify, so that if the first, second, and third offense is up to the twenty-five, up to the fifty, up to the seventy-five. Not putting a um, a basement, if you will, on that. Does that make sense? Minimum. Unless it's not possible. I'm not following. Um, so a violation by minor up to $25 for a first offense, up to $50 for a second offense, up to $75 for a third offense? Well, the difficulty is if you want to have it in the pay-by-mail schedule, it has to have a fixed amount. Okay. It can't be arranged. Okay. Uh, thank you for that. Then I'll change it to just uh, the straight-out $25, $50, and $75 <laughs> figures. Uh, and that's, I'd like to clarify that as the motion. Okay, so these are not ranges. And currently, uh, Mr. Holtz, it's at 25, 50, and 
a hundred? Is that what the third is? Or is there a well, pay by mail for the third? For for all offenses, the pay by mail amount for curfew is fifty dollars flat, regardless of first, second, or third offense, regardless of whether it's a juvenile or the adult responsible for the juvenile who's committed the offense. It's simply fifty dollars. That the confusion here goes back to the points that I made in my previous memo on this thing, which is that there's these there's these kind of overlapping, somewhat contradictory fine provisions relating to the curfew ordinance. There's the pay by mail fine, which uh, I think formerly was $75 minimum, is now $50 minimum. Uh, and then there's also language in there in the ordinance <coughs> itself about this these uh, escalating series of minimums. Technically, they don't they don't contradict each other because one set is pay by mail, the other set is if you're in court. But I think it's extremely confusing for everybody. Nobody can read that and really understand it. So I'm suggesting as part of this process that we just tidy that up, we get rid of the, the apparently conflicting provisions and just, and just set some numbers and be happy with them. Okay, so that's what we're doing here, 25, 50, 75. Okay, is there any discussion? Yes, Ms. Wyman. I should make sure I underst uh, understand just the, because there, we've got differences in violations by minors as opposed to violations by parents, is it possible or would, in a circumstance, would both a minor and that minor's parent or guardian be fined for the same offense of, of, being, of a minor being out past curfew? It's possible. I can't remember it happening in recent times, I, but it certainly is possible. And how would that happen? Uh, if the minor's out and the parent doesn't care, basically, what it comes down to. So, the if I understand the scenario correctly, the minor is is caught out past curfew. Uh, the police contact the parent or guardian, and the parent or guardian then says, when when they're asked by the the police officer, did you know that your child is is out and it's past curfew, and the parent says, no, I didn't, and I don't care. Yeah, or yes, I did, and I don't care. <laughs> I knew, but I don't care. Okay. And it and a time when a when a juvenile uh, minor would be uh, violating the ordinance, and the guardian or parent would not would be. No, I didn't know the the minor was out. Thank you for telling me. Please bring the minor home. And then that's only an offense by a minor. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Any other discussion on this amendment? Mm -hmm. Yes, Mr. Whalen. In my uh, widely designed ward, I have noticed uh, or have been brought to the, my attention, certainly, <clears throat> uh, a, a couple who had a child who had stayed out late and wouldn't come home. And uh, when that child did come home, his father got into a face-off with him, and the kid punched the father. And uh, the kid had his uh, a friend there with him who used was used as a witness to the fact that uh, <clears throat> the father pushed the kid, his son. And uh, so he was the father was arrested. There is a breakdown here of parental control think that uh, I understand there is a, a, a Supreme Court uh, or a decision that affects this this uh, ordinance but uh, I find the, the whole idea of parental control being lessened to be very upsetting to me and in this town uh, I would think that we need more uh, of that kind of parental control and so I plan to vote against this any further discussion I I think I misunderstood mr. Whalen if you could I don't mean to take up more time but you say you don't think there's enough parental control so you're going to vote against oh. an ordinance that requires curfew or you're, you're opposed to the lowering of the f I'm, I'm opposed to the liberal not I won't use the word liberal because I respect it much too much but the lackadaisical uh, appreciation of the fines being lessened 
Okay. Thank you. And it reflects an attitude that I think is unhealthy. And <coughs> okay. Is there any further discussion on this amendment? Seeing no further discussion, all those in favor, please signify by saying I'll aye. I'll make a roll aye. call. Uh, Mr. Whalen's asked for a roll call. Ms. Clark, could you please call the roll? Ms. Shenoweth? Yes. Mr. Hayes? Yes. Ms. Hooth? Yes. Ms. Pat? Yes. Mr. Whalen? Absolutely not. Ms. Wyman? Yes. Motion carries. Uh, we're back to the main motion, which is the uh, curfew, uh, amending the curfew ordinance. Um, Ms. Chenoweth? I'd like, to make a I'd like to make the motion to delete under C2 the phrase, sim a very simple change, delete the phrase without any detour or stop. Second. I'm sorry, it's on page two, about halfway down. We have a motion and a second. Um, is there any discussion? As uh, Ms. Chenoweth? Yeah, I, I, um, I have concerns actually about the entire ordinance, but um, in particular, I think that if there's subjectivity involved in the ordinance, the subjectivity should be in the hands of the parents, not the our police department. So to say that um, to make it put on on police officers the onus that they must need, they must decide whether or not a person pausing on the street, uh, gassing up at the gas station, etc., is a detour or stop. I think is not. Um, it, it just opens up a lot of loopholes. I think that, you know, what I see in this ordinance is that basically it's asking, um, you know, do you have your parents' permission? Are you involved in an activity where you have a parent's permission? Uh, and there's a list of things that could be eligible activities, but uh, w last week we added any activity. So really that's, you know, you are, you can be um, legally out past curfew if you have the permission of your parents. Now. Um, a police officer stops a minor, asks that person, uh, a, a stops somebody under the age of 16, asks that person, you know, where are you going? What are you doing? The person says, you know, I went to the art theater and got out at 11 o'clock and it's past curfew. I'm going home. Um, so the police officer could either at that point decide, okay, I believe this person, or they could say, I'm going to take you home and ask your parents. At that point, the parent could you know, could then say, yes, this person had permission and game over, kid is home. In this case, um, a police officer can make and ask, they can determine by looking at a, at a child, is this person detouring, is, are they stopping? Um, and based on that, they can decide that even if this person, this, this minor, so to speak, is doing something that is an eligible activity that they have their parents consent for, pausing, stopping, detouring, these are all very subjective things in my opinion, um, leave it open to interpretation of the police as to decide that. I really think that that interpretation needs to be in the hands of parents and then parents can say, yeah, I told them that they can go to the art theater and afterwards, you know, grab a bite to eat and come home and grabbing the bite to eat is fine or, you know, yeah, they're dropping off a friend or they're gassing up, these were okay things to do. So. I, you know, I think that the weakness of the ordinance is with the words without any detour or stop. We, we get the same <laughs> thing out of the ordinance without the, those lang that language in that, that the police can bring the child home and parents can say yes permission or no permission and the police don't have to determine whether or not a pause or a stop was uh, being committed, so to speak. Any other discussion? Discussion, all those in favor of this amendment, please signify by saying aye. Call, please. Uh, Mr. Williams asked for a roll call again. Ms. Shenoweth? Yes. Mr. Hayes? Yes. Ms. Hooth? Yes. Ms. Pat? Yes. Mr. Whalen? No. Ms. Wyman? Yes. Uh, motion carries. Uh, before us again is the main curfew ordinance. 
Any other discussion? Thank you. Just one point of clarification, a question for Mr. Holtz. Uh, do I understand correctly that if we were to pass this now, the next item C is not, does not require action because there is, in fact, no separate ordinance 2004-08-106? That's correct. Thank you. Uh, I have a question, though. Maybe I wasn't, uh, maybe I didn't hear earlier when the motions were made about the fine amounts. Was there a fine amount proposed for subparagraph E where I also have a blank? Yes. Uh-huh. Yeah, that was $75. That was part of that motion. Okay. Yeah. So uh, the motion before you, you know, I didn't, is for the ordinance and the um, fines. Any other discussion? I just wanted to, to point out something uh, regarding Mr. Whalen's comments about the lowering of the fines. I, I just I think there needs to be a clarification. If you look at the memorandum, the first page dated August 13, 2004, points out that um, that the in the pay, present pay by mail uh, amounts that are for curfew violations, the first offense is three dollars to twenty five. Second offense, 25 to 50. Third offense, 100 to 200. So, in fact, uh, if this ordinance pass, passes as it's been amended, there will actually be actually be an increase uh, in the first offense and second offense to um, the 25 and 50 dollars, rather than the three dollars to 25 and 25 to 50 in the pay by mail amount. I don't know if that helps or confuses, but uh, I just wanted to point that out. Thank you. Any further discussion. <laughs> Mr. Whalen, um, Ms. Wyman, I I didn't object to it for that reason. That was uh, Mr. Holtz's, I think, concern. But uh, my concern is the whole issue of the curfew. I once uh, took a child in to our house, and uh, he uh, was stayed out late and, and uh, wouldn't obey the curfew that the law had set and that I had set. And uh, <clears throat> it took some argument with the young man to uh, get him to uh, listen to that. And that's just one example. I think that our culture has taken away many, too many uh, con controls that parents would have, be it subjective or objective. I think that we need to reinforce that rather than uh, <clears throat> uh, demean it. And so I, I don't know what to say. I mean, <laughs> except that I think that nine council would be a good idea here. Is there any further discussion? Yes, Ms. Chenoweth. Um, I can't support this ordinance. Uh, our old ordinance uh, the history of this, as I understand, is that our old ordinance may have been unconstitutional. Um, certainly in Indiana there are some cases, and Mr. Holt has reviewed that. Um, I think this ordinance is, is much better in terms of constitutionality. Um, but but I, I, I disagree with it in principle. Um, I strongly feel, and this is perhaps the libertarian in me coming out, that families should determine how to conduct themselves, not government, and that families can determine and enforce whatever policies they may have on their own. Um, and I think that those <coughs> diversity in terms of ways in which people parent, that I feel like in some ways uh, an ordinance like this is in antiquated. So I feel as though um, that, that and, and the fact that whenever I see an ordinance that um, takes a category of people and severely restricts their ability to have free mobility, that, that, that frightens me on some level. I think that um, children in the society are one of the categories of people who haven't organized themselves adequately enough to, uh, in some ways, say you know, we, we have certain rights and that we should assert those rights. And uh, um, I, don't, I don't think this is a necessary ordinance. I think it's government. I think it's important. Is there further discussion on the main motion? Mr. Whalen. <clears throat> there are, there's a lot of things that uh, Ms. Chenoweth says that uh, I would agree with, although I'm not a libertarian. Um, but I do think that uh, 
we should give parents more control and parents should give themselves more control and the, the breakdown of the family in this country today is a major problem and so for that reason I would object to this however saying that I think that Mr. Holt has done a great job in, in putting this together for us, and I compliment him for that effort. Uh, and I do recognize the need for uh, some kind of a curfew, which is uh, can result, that is, a lack of curfew can result in uh, people being da damaging to other people and that's our function as a government so I will oppose this at this time however not in principle totally but because of the fines and also the notion that parents are don't have the right and responsibility to take uh, to control their children is there further discussion? Ms. Chenoweth. I promise this will be my last comment, but I, um, I just wanted to urge counsel to understand that people are innocent until proven guilty. And when I hear statements like, we should have an ordinance that will possibly prevent kids from committing crimes, which is what I see this ordinance to be about, I think, why is it the kids doing something that doesn't hurt anyone, that isn't stealing from anybody? Why is that? How is it that we feel as though it is it is constitutional um, and and acknowledges and respects um, the right of law? How we could possibly think that preemptive arrest, which is what I consider an ordinance like this to be, preemptive arrest is an okay to treat anybody in this city? Um, we do not. We, we, there are other ways to prevent crime besides preemptive arrest. The further discussion. Very briefly, philosophically, I don't disagree with any of that. I, th I think the main purpose of curfew law is that um, a lot of kids, by the time they're 15 and 16, don't um, follow their parents' rules a lot, and a lot of parents of teenage um, kids would uh, feel that uh, they need curfew laws to back up their own curfew. And what gets their kids to come home on time is the fact that it's not, it's not just mom said so, but it's the law. And um, I, I also do think that, and, and I've heard from many parents of teenagers, they don't like when the law it contradicts the parental judgment. And as I mentioned, we discussed as a committee that probably most often arises on weeknights that are not school nights, because a very common practice is for parents to give different curfews for school nights and non-school nights, and the law distinguishes weeknights from weekends rather than school nights from not school nights. But overall, I think what we have here in this ordinance is a uh, something that we're told is constitutional and a backup for parents to enforce their own curfew without any severe penalty uh, for people who are otherwise law-abiding but in violation of this law further discussion just one quick comment uh, and um, you know I didn't think we were going to get into the merits of curfew ordinances in general rather than just the uh, tweaking this uh, I think the majority of people believe that curfew ordinances are a good thing for a community ha to have not only to put some guidelines for the young people of our community but to help protect the young people in our community. I think I don't have the statistics in front of me but I've seen them and uh, that when young people are out late at night past curfew they are overwhelmingly the victims of crimes and when you see statistics like that you can't ignore them as a community and sure it may um, uh, infringe on people's freedom to a certain degree but the benefits that are provided to the community as a whole uh, far outweigh the, the uh, infringement on the freedoms and uh, if I mean we as a society have agreed that those are things that we need to look at the statistics show for instance that wearing your seatbelt cuts down on automobile um, 
injuries, or injuries from automobile accidents. And so we have a law that we have to buckle your seatbelt. And it's common sense uh, laws like this that, sure, it infringes your freedom. I don't like to buckle my seatbelt. I grew up in an era where you didn't have to do it, and it, it's been, you know, a, a decades-long process for me to get used to it. I don't like it. But uh, I do it when I remember, and uh, I think it's a, <laughs> I think it's I think it's good. I haven't quite gotten in the habit of doing it all the time, but I do. I've, I've told myself I feel more secure, and I am safer when I do that. And uh, there are good reasons because uh, you, you are safer, and the chances of you getting into a serious injury uh, are less when you do that. And the same is true with an ordinance like this. I mean, the statistics show that that kids are often victims of crimes at, at late hours, and uh, we as a society should recognize that. So I encourage your support. Further discussion, Ms. Wyman. Just uh, one small point. Uh, one of the, I think the amendments that we made at last week's uh, committee meeting included, uh, if I can just point your attention to it, Ida, on page two, item G, an activity. Uh, there's not a violation of the curfew if it involves an activity approved by the minor's parent, legal guardian, or custodian. And I think that that, that helps to add as, work as a catch-all uh, in this ordinance so that if the parent uh, is uh, even if the parent isn't aware that the minor is out but then finds out the parent could simply state that they uh, that that the that the parent approved of the minor's activity sure but please bring the bring the minor home or something like that and deal with the minor uh, or the uh, the curfew violation in their own home in their own way rather than uh, allowing a fine to be uh, to be placed on the minor simply by agreeing when they've when they've been contacted that 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 activity is approved and I think that that helps to um, again enforce the parents uh, help help parents enforce their own parental guidelines without bringing the city uh, and, and the police into too much involvement um, that that the parents wouldn't approve of in in handling their own family affairs so I'll be supporting this thank you any further discussion Further discussion, will the clerk please call the roll? Ms. Shinoweth? No. Mr. Hayes? Yes. Ms. Hooth? Yes. Ms. Pat? Yes. Mr. Whalen? No. Ms. Wyman? Yes. That motion carries with four ayes. Uh, Ms. Ms. Pat? I want to continue you. with the report from the Committee of the Whole? Thank you. Uh, item C is uh, removed because it's uh, no longer necessary. Item D was sent to our September 7th uh, Council meeting, and so we're on Item 1E, a resolution number 2004-08018R, a resolution to impose a temporary moratorium on permitting outdoor advertising sign structures until an interim development ordinance can be adopted to impose a moratorium on outdoor advertising sign structures issuance while the review of the number, placement, and development standards of outdoor advertising sign structures is being completed. For the committee, I so move. Second. Uh, we have a motion and a second. Is there any discussion? Yes, Ms. Chalmers. I just have a quick question that came up between our last conversation and this one, which is, um, do we uh, currently charge a, a, what would it be called, a permit fee for the construction of a, of a billboard? Do we know that? Yes. We do. And what's the, what's the level of that <coughs> the permit fee? Or where does it stand in relation to a permit fee to build something else, for example? It's one of our signed permits. I can't tell you off the top of my head what it is, but it's in our schedule. Is it more expensive to have a permit to build, to build a billboard than to put a sign up, say, in front of a building? Say you, say you uh, purchase a building and it's got, you know, it's mixed office residential or something and it doesn't have a sign and you go and you want to put a, a monumental kind of monument sign up. You, get, you have to get a permit for that sign, correct? Uh, what's the, is it more expensive to get a permit for a billboard? It may not be, but I'm not sure. You'd have to look it up. Okay. I, it's be a standard sign permit. Okay. I, it's, it's not... Because this is on the table, I raise the issue. It's not actually completely relevant to what's on the table today, but I think that in reviewing, we are thinking about this moratorium in an attempt to review our whole structure, and I think one of the things we might want to look at, at the very least, I mean, there's many things that we've discussed, is um, 
ways in which to, to, you know, there's a certain impact billboards have on a community, and I wonder if the fees either to rent or to build the billboard, I don't think there's a fee currently to rent, um, to us at least, that, that it perhaps um, would make sense for us to demonstrate the impact of billboards on our community in terms of the fees if we are to have billboards in the future. So I, I add that to the pot. You can stir it as we discuss this in the future. Most of our um, building fees are either just by type or by cost of construction. So we don't impose higher fee fees for more objectionable types of uses. But we do have things like landfills where there can be a very hefty fee, so that, that can be something we can look at. Okay. Any other discussion? It's a question. Yes, Mr. Whalen. <coughs> Let me, uh, we've been talking about signs for the Sunnycrest area for over a couple of years. And uh, I understand that there is a charge for some of these people to put up a sign. Isn't that true? It's a sign permit fee. It, it's not a huge fee. Again, I can't tell you without the schedule fees exactly what it is and if it's based on construction cost. But the real cost of sign construction is in the structure. They're very expensive. And I think you know the fee that we charge, whether it's $50 or, or whatever, is a pretty minor part of that. Thank you. Any other discussion? No other discussion? All those in favor of this Matt, resolution? I'd like yeah. to uh, roll call on this, please. And I will mention why, if you like, if you give me a chance. Okay. Let me just I take can. the opportunity uh, <clears throat> to say that I I get Ms. Wyman's hair out of her eyes there. So, uh, the, um, I, I really object to a lot of our signage laws. I don't think that we understand or appreciate the need for uh, the communication by um, <coughs> businesses to the public. And I have designed a couple of signs that won awards from the CCDC here in town and, uh, and pride myself in, in uh, graphic uh, design. And I, just because that's what I used to do for a living. But I think that uh, our, our laws are too restrictive and we'll have to explore that when it comes to, uh, to give a lift to the Sunnycrest area. I think they can be offensive. Uh, that are garish and and over, you know, overloaded with information, uh, can cheapen an area, and I I decry that. At the same time, I do not th think I think our our ordinance is, is flawed, so I will vote against this. Hey, any uh, any further discussion, Ms. Pat? Thank you. It, at committee, we discussed that. Uh, the part of the motivation for this uh, moratorium to further review number of placement and development of um, basically of billboards is uh, was uh, complaints that we were receiving from Urbana business people that their own signage was being blocked by billboards and new standards of the state allows for lower billboards and there was an accident because of um, <coughs> possibly related to uh, blocking visibility of traffic it's to explore those issues uh, that uh, we would be initiating this moratorium. Any further discussion? Can I reply? Yes, Mr. Whalen. Sorry to, to burden you with this again. I, I agree, Ms. Patton, that is a good reason. And uh, however, I do think that uh, it wouldn't hurt to let things go as they are, understanding that we can uh, restrict them and when once we um, we uh, bring a new ordinance into effect mm -hmm. any further discussion no further discussion all those in favor please signify by saying I oh Did mr. Whalen asked for a roll call on this part miss Shenoweth yes mr. Hayes miss Hooth miss Pat yes mr. Whalen no miss Wyman yes motion carries with five eyes Ms. Pat. Thank you. <clears throat> We're on item 1F, ordinance number 2408107, an ordinance amending chapter 24, article 6 of the Code of Ordinances, increasing the size of the Urbana Public Television Commission. For the committee, I so move. Second. A motion and a second. 
Uh, is there any discussion? Uh, Ms. Wyman? I guess just a, a question. Uh, if it's the clerk or the mayor or who is the one who will then forward this information to the, um, uh, to the library board to let them know, perhaps to ask them to put on their next agenda this issue for discussion or, or um, nominations? Yeah, I can email Mr. Schliff and let him know that uh, they've got an appointment or they can, they can nominate. Thank you. Discussion? If not, will the clerk please call the roll? Ms. Shenoweth? Yes. Mr. Hayes? Ms. Huth? Yes. Ms. Pat? Yes. Mr. Whalen? Yes. Ms. Wyman? Yes. Uh, that motion carries with six ayes. Ms. Um, several items under new business this evening. Uh, an ordinance. First is an ordinance approving a final subdivision plat, Savannah Green Subdivision Phase 6. Plan case number 1904-S-04. Mr. Kowalski. Thank you. Not too much to report on this. Um, this is the second to last phase for Savannah Green. The final plat for phase six would create 29 lots and extend Oglethorpe um, Avenue and Rainbow View Drive. Um, the subdivision is near complete. You'll see uh, phase seven at your next council meeting, and that would be it for Savannah Green. So I um, would recommend approval of the final plat. Happy to answer any questions. Questions for Mr. Kowalski? Mayor. Yes. <clears throat> Mr. Whalen? Rob, are we going to have any, uh, has the street light uh, agreement that was arrived at by the mayor and by Mr. Walden and, and uh, so many good people, uh, that has been resolved? That has been resolved. My understanding is the developer had agreed at the request of the city to put in the decorative street lighting as originally envisioned. The people out there will be very happy to hear that, of course, as some of them do know already because they were very concerned about that. Right. And it's hard to know how you approach a private contract like that. But in, will this, uh, in this new subdivision, uh, the ex expansion of the development, will that be continued, that same uh, con contributory yeah, for, for for this phase of the development and the in the last phase, which will be coming up, it's all part of the same development that would have the same kind of street lights that uh, he's now agreed to put in. That's great. I must say that <clears throat> nobody, I, not many people really know how hard our mayor worked and uh, our our uh, chief administrative officer and your department to uh, bring these uh, the developers to an understanding where the people were concerned and I played a very small role in that but it took a number of us to, to get this done and it, it it frequently happens by the back door and uh, so people should I would say be you know can be proud of their, their city and it's working for their benefit thank you Rob okay any other uh, discussion um, if there are no other questions, a motion would be in order. Move approval. Second. We have a motion and a second. Is there any discussion? <coughs> There's uh, no discussion. Will the clerk please call the roll? Ms. Shenoweth? Yes. Mr. Hayes? Yes. Ms. Hoof? Yes. Ms. Pat? Yes. Mr. Whalen? Aye. Ms. Wyman? Yes. That motion carries with six ayes. Uh, next is an ordinance approving, approving a preliminary and final plat. This is for a Prairie Wind Subdivision, plan case number 1902-S-04. Mr. Kowalski. This uh, combination preliminary and final plat comes from the uh, August 5th meeting of the Plan Commission. They unanimously recommended approval tonight. Uh, again, this is for the 31-acre development uh, that Paul Tapman is building on what's commonly referred to as the Galladay Tract on uh, south side of Colorado Avenue, east of Philo Road. The uh, final plat would create uh, 29 single family lots, um, one lot for the senior retirement center and one lot for the uh, condominium planned unit development uh, that was approved as part of the annexation agreement last year. Uh, the plat most uh, importantly would also extend Colorado Avenue and would create two local level roads and a private drive for Prairie Wind Circle that would serve the condos. Um, 
It has been sent uh, to agencies for their review from <laughs> utilities and easements, et cetera, and uh, drainage has been preliminarily reviewed and approved. And uh, again, the Planning Commission recommends approval of it. I'd be happy to answer any questions, and I see that Bob Dean from uh, Blank West Lincoln Cook is the project engineer and probably could answer some questions if you have any as well. Hey, any questions for Mr. Kowalski? Uh, if there are no questions, the motion would be in order. Move approval. Second. Second. We have a motion and a second. Any discussion? Yes, Ms. Chenoweth? Um, I just want to thank staff and, and Paul Tapman for <coughs> working together to alter what used to be a stubbed off street and make it something that uh, with new development could actually uh, mesh with the surrounding areas. So if council members remember uh, our last conversation about this, I believe Lucas, what is now Lucas Street, was going to be stubbed off and there was going to be a bike path which does allow some kind of pedestrian throughput but um, I know this council raised concerns about that I know st staff and uh, Mr. Tapman worked on that and I see in the preliminary plat that it actually is a street that is ready to go through with you know the existence of development to the um, to the south there so I really think that unlike a lot of communities that I've gone to where uh, you can't really get through neighborhoods, one neighborhood into the next. They're all kind of their own gated community, so to speak. This really <coughs> allows for kind of the uh, open access um, that I think makes makes cities great, and I, I'm glad to see that. Any other discussion? There's no other discussion. Will the clerk please call the roll? Ms. Chenoweth? Yes. Mr. Hayes? Yes. Ms. Huth? Yes. Ms. Pat? Yes. Mr. Whalen? Yes. Ms. Wyman. Yes. That motion carries with six ayes. Uh, next is an ordinance to correct a typographical error in ordinance number 2004-06-078 entitled an ordinance fixing a time and place for a public hearing in connection with a proposed supplement and amendment to the redevelopment plan and related redevelopment projects for the downtown Urbana tax increment redevelopment project area. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, this is basically just a little cleanup work. Um, you know, earlier this summer, uh, a hearing date was set for uh, reviewing the uh, TIF amendment for TIF 1 and supplement. And uh, the uh, date that was set was September 7th, 2004, which is correct. Uh, however, the, the day was listed as a Monday, which ordinarily is when you meet, but uh, that particular day because of the Labor Day weekend is a Tuesday, and uh, that needs to be corrected as well as setting the, the meeting time for 7.15 rather than 7.30. So we just thought we'd clean that up. Okay. Any questions about that? No questions. Um, motion would be in order. Move approval. Second. Motion and second. Any discussion? There's no discussion. Will the clerk please call the roll? Ms. Shenoweth? Yes. Mr. Hayes? Yes. Ms. Hoof? Yes. Ms. Pat? Yes. Mr. Whalen? Yes. Ms. Wyman? Yes. Uh, that motion carries with six ayes. <laughs> Next we have an ordinance requesting that the U.S. Department of Housing and Urban Development grant exceptions for conflicts of interest of alderperson Laura Hooth. Uh, I don't know exactly how we want to start with this. Uh, Mayor, I think Mr. Walton passed you a note about that. Yeah, um, I mean, this has been an ongoing item for uh, a number of months, and um, Habitat for Humanity uh, just delivered a letter late this afternoon uh, to Mr. Walden indicating that they are withdrawing their request for uh, funding. Um, this would be CDBG and home funds and for um, lots uh, to be dedicated to Habitat for Humanity. Uh, as I said, this came late this afternoon. Um, I guess the supposition is that this may um, uh, eliminate the conflict of interest. Is that right, Mr. Roller? There's a chance that this might eliminate the There's, a, there's a possibility. We just need to have a look at the situation now. The uh, the letter sets forth some uh, a change in the situation, a significant change in the situation, and that uh, would certainly change the analysis of it. And uh, we just need to uh, take 
uh, take a little bit of time aside and have a look at it and see what it really does. We feel we also uh, really ought to have a conversation with the HUD officials about it to make sure that they agree with our analysis of it. Uh, uh, it, it does not necessarily mean that uh, that the conflict has gone. It's a possibility, but the conflict may still be there. And the conflict is um, uh, one where Ms. Huth, as a council member, uh, is in a position to vote on funding uh, from the home and CDBG and for an organization which she is now executive director. Uh, and HUD regulations uh, and, and is it state regulations as well, our um, state statute as well, uh, indicate that um, uh, being in both of those positions where you would be receiving money uh, at, for the organization would be a conflict of interest. Is that right? That's essentially correct, yes. So, and this, so this may resolve that conflict of interest? It could. Okay, so... Um, so we'll do some analysis on this, and then if uh, uh, bring it back if uh, this doesn't clear up the, the conflict. Is, is that uh, my understanding? Yes. Okay. Is there any objection then to uh, uh, moving on to the next item? And we'll bring this back if it's necessary, if this particular action by Habitat doesn't clear up uh, Ms. Sooth's conflict of interest. Okay, there's no objection. <coughs> All right, uh, we'll go on to item five under new business, and that's an ordinance authorizing the chief administrative officer to execute an agreement between Ameren Corporation and the cities of Champaign, Illinois, and Urbana, Illinois, concerning the acquisition of Illinois power by Ameren. Um, Mr. Holtz. Thanks. Yeah, my memo spells this out pretty well. Uh, essentially, we've been we have intervened in the ICC proceeding with respect to the the takeover of Illinois Power by Ameren, and in that context, we have uh, negotiated a settlement agreement. The negotiation is for a total of fourteen million dollars to the cities, six million dollars per year uh, to be paid out. Uh, not pardon me, not paid out to be used. Uh, to correct deficiencies, primarily those that would be identified by engineering audits, uh, an additional $1 million per year to be uh, uh, spent a little bit with a little bit more discretion by the cities. Uh, in addition, they'll pay $50,000 uh, towards our uh, engineering fees. I think that essentially covers it. Hey, are there any... Mr. Walden, did you want to add anything? I just want to disclose that those are <coughs> towards future engineering the amounts of <coughs> monies that we have invested in. It's probably seventeen, eighteen thousand. 18000 Just out that money, which we already did a budget amount. Now, is that for. our share or was that the... That, that was our that's share. Our share. Our okay, share. and that's being matched in equal <coughs> amounts by the University, by the University in Champaign. Is that right? So we spent a total of over 50000 We spent about dollars. half of the amount of the money that was allocated, so that's probably somewhere around 50000 Around dollars. 50 out of 100. For authors, right. So, the, so the, the, the funds for engineering are for our future uh, engineering fees associated with the review audit. The review of the audit, right. Any questions about this, uh, Ms. Wyman? just have a few questions. Um, I'll just go in order of the memo. On page two of the memo, where you talk about negotiation of a settlement agreement under audit, it says the major provisions, it, major provision is an agreement by Ameren that if it acquires IP, it will conduct an audit of its electric transmission and distribution <laughs> facilities. Is that an independent audit, or they're going to do it and tell us whether they're complying? They would do it. The settlement agreement has, uh, has laid out uh, specific types of things that they look at, various types of protective devices. Uh, uh, I think there's, a, uh, you know, you're talking engineering here. None of us will understand it. We worked together with our engineering consultants to develop the parameters of, of the audit that would be performed, and, and our engineers are, are satisfied, uh, that is our consulting engineers, uh, are satisfied that this, would, uh, that this would provide us a lot of much needed information about the uh, about the reliability of the system and where it needs to be fixed up. Okay. Uh, a couple other questions on the issues regarding expenditures, item D on page three of the memo. Mm -hmm. um, 
a commitment to spend at least six million dollars um, in each of the next two years following the close of the transaction. How much is spent now? Well, you, yeah, right now we're under Illinois Power, so we don't know. That kind of information just isn't available, uh, not even through, uh, not even uh, through confidential documents that uh, have been made available to us. Um, I, I, I can say that it's. Uh, it, it, it is true that Illinois Power has budgeted sig certain sums of money annually to uh, to uh, perform system upgrades and do various kinds of work that they're supposed to do, but uh, just because they budgeted it doesn't mean they've spent it, and in fact they have not, uh, certainly not spent all the money that they had uh, supposedly allocated for this. Uh, it's, it, there's, it's not certain whether or not they would have spent this $6 million anyways regardless of this agreement. It could well be that they had intended to. Uh, uh, it, nevertheless, uh, what this agreement really gives us is a process by which we get to have a say in how that money gets spent. The engineering studies get done, we look at what the system needs and where the problems are, and then, uh, and then our consultant who answers to us works together with them to determine what the most important priorities are in the repair of the system here locally. Okay, I have. Uh, so, so you're, you think the six million dollar figure is a good figure compared to what we believe hasn't <coughs> been going on under IP? Yeah, particularly in light of the fact that would, that uh, it's tied to this audit process. Uh, significantly in the agreement there is a commitment uh, over the next five years to uh, complete the work that the audit requires. Now, uh, uh, ultimately, Illinois Power, pardon me, not Illinois Power, Ameren, if the deal goes through, uh, would have say over exactly what gets spent where. Um, but again, because of the process that we've gotten them to commit to, uh, I think it significantly improves our situation and certainly significantly improves the level of knowledge that we have about the system and why there are problems with it. Okay, and um, the $6 million is just for the Champaign-Urbana area, just in Illinois, just... Uh... For the Champaign-Urbana area, uh, and uh, essentially the, the thought is that this will be uh, engineering-driven uh, decisions about how to spend that $6 million. The, uh, the extra million dollars per year is, uh, is, uh, has a little bit more of a discretionary component for the cities. Um, uh, and although it's, uh, it's it, it considered to be essentially engineering uh, driven as well, there is, more, uh, there is more leeway for the city to say, well, uh, this is something that matters more to us here than maybe it might somewhere else or give us <coughs> more judgment to exercise. I have I'm sorry, one final question. Under the agreement, page 4, item number 3, or F3, it says Ameren IP agrees to expend a maximum of $1 million in each of 2005 and 2006. Uh, and I'm wondering, it sure doesn't look like there's a minimum figure there, and how concerned are you, and how concerned should we be that there's no minimum figure? Let's have a look at the exact oh. language. Uh, page, yeah, it's page four, right above item G, previously identified concerns. Looking at number three, first sentence. Hmm. I don't feel uncomfortable with it, you know, because again, it's tied to the audit process and tied to the work uh, where they're working jointly with our engineers. Do you know why the, they... The fact is, the fact is, I think, my guess is in the long run they'll spend more than this because, again, uh, the, uh, uh, the commitment is uh, for this stuff to be taken care of completely over five years. Okay, thank you. That's all the questions I have for now. Other uh, questions? One item that uh, is in that part that Ms. Wyman just uh, mentioned is uh, a change uh, in philosophy between the two companies and that's the very last uh, where that million dollars uh, may include undergrounding existing facilities as addressed in section B2. Um, Illinois Power has for years insisted that they are an above ground uh, power distribution uh, company or the distribution portion is, is above ground and this is an acknowledgement uh, by Ameren 
that it is the desire of Champaign-Urbana to uh, investigate some undergrounding of the uh, distribution system for electricity. Now, obviously, we can't do it all at once. It's uh, uh, cost prohibitive, but at least uh, this is a, a significant change in philosophy uh, of our power company if Ameren is uh, successful in uh, buying IP. Other questions? Uh, uh, yes, Ms. Chenoweth. Yeah, I have, a, I have the similar concerns as, as Ms. Wyman stated with the self-audit. I think that this is, um, although I think that you actually bring to us a, a better package than I anticipated, so on one hand I think this, this, there are pieces of this are, are, are great. On the other hand, um, I think the, the industry standard seems to be, um, you know, we don't, we, we don't want anyone auditing our basic, you know, we want, we want to audit ourselves and we want to be able to control the information that goes to the city and of course I don't trust that and I just, I, I do think that you have tried to put controls on or guidelines on what they should be looking for and what they need to uh, demonstrate and I guess, you know, there's, there's a chance that they would have to tell the truth in, in certain instances on on the details of this, um, but I do have that concern. The second is a question, which is um, the confidentiality issue. What if, in my understanding in this agreement, uh, I believe, let's see, page two of the agreement, uh, about halfway down, number seven. Um, let's see, the Ameren will share the findings of the audit with the cities. Um, at which point there will be a confidentiality agreement. And I understand, you know, perhaps concerns of Homeland Security, but um, other concerns like like safety are, I guess, um, things that I'm I'm concerned about. How could how can a city or would we? Here's my question: Would we sign a confidentiality agreement about something that might be a health and safety issue that I think we have the responsibility to? inform our our constituents of. Well, you'll see uh, that the, the language of this was carefully crafted to address exactly that <coughs> okay. concern. Uh, uh, the proposal we initially got uh, from Ameren was to, uh, was a requirement that we would sign on a confidentiality agreement that they would lay in front of us. Uh, we refused to do that uh, uh, mm. very much because of those kinds of concerns. Uh, and because we have, we recognize that we have the obligation to answer to the citizens uh, at large and to the and to uh, the <coughs> constituents here, and that it's hard to do that when you can't tell them what's behind your reasoning. So <coughs> we asked them, well, what really? What is your concern? And they said, well, basically, it's homeland security type of stuff. And so we said, well, fine, we'll sign an agreement that protects homeland security type of information, and we all have a pretty good idea of what that is. Uh, in fact, there's a Freedom of Information Act exemption that uh, that uh, specifically addresses homeland security types of <coughs> concerns. That was an exemption that was put in the FOIA, uh, oh, I think within the last six, six or 12 months. Um, and, uh, and if anybody wants any additional uh, exceptions, um, uh, any additional requirements that remain confidential, it would have to be agreed to by both parties. So mm -hmm. it's not enough for Ameren to say, well, we think you should also hold this secret because we're afraid that somebody will find out about it and sue us because it, you know, it could harm children or something. Mm -hmm. Well, we won't sign off on that, and there's nothing in that language that would require us to sign off on it. So we okay. sign off on Homeland Security stuff, and otherwise we'll sign off on only what we agree to sign off. That's acceptable. Any other questions? Not a motion would be in order. So moved. Second. Motion and a second. Any discussion? Wyman? Just one short thing. I, I think this, uh, as, as other council members have said, this is a, um, a good settlement offer. I think that it also, as I understand it, doesn't preclude the city f sometime in the future from looking at um, our own, uh, having establishing our own municipal um, utility service, similar to Rantoul and, and similar to that which uh, some people of Urbana, uh, Champaign Urbana have been talking with us about. But in the meantime, or if that uh, doesn't occur, I think this is a good settlement and uh, I certainly support it. 
That point's correct. It does not preclude us at it from any time in the future uh, looking at municipalization of the system, nor does it preclude us from taking actions such as uh, aggregation of customers uh, to purchase power. None of those things are precluded by this agreement. Any other discussion? Discussion? Will the clerk please call the roll? Ms. Shenoweth? Yes. Mr. Hayes? Yes. Ms. Hooth? Yes. Ms. Pat? Yes. Mr. Whalen? <coughs> yes. Ms. Wyman? Yes. That motion carries with six ayes. Uh, next, we have uh, 600 new business and ordinance amending the zoning ordinance of the city of Urbana, Illinois. Revisions to various sections of the Urbana zoning ordinance as they pertain to the requirements of the MOR district plan case number 1897 T 04. And we've got uh, Mr. Kowalski and Ms. Octay to present to us. They've been doing an awful lot of work on this uh, over the last several months. And so we look forward to the presentation. Great. Uh, thank you. Um, I want to give a little bit of background about the uh, materials tonight and the process. Um, some of it you already know, but might be beneficial for our viewers and people in the audience. Uh, and Michaela is going to go through the, um, the guidelines briefly. Um, we're not going to do a PowerPoint or anything like that, but um, she's going to go through the main components of the guidelines, and then uh, we'll take questions. Um, you'll recall in July of 2003, Council passed a four-month uh, moratorium on development in the MOR zoning district. And the two primary goals for that moratorium were to, uh, number one, revamp the Development Review Board, which was an all-staff board at that time, and um, consider a, a, a board that would be more consistent with some of our other boards and commissions and have it a citizen and, and uh, resident type of board. Uh, and then, but number two, also uh, consider the development of some design guidelines uh, for the district. Um, the way the, uh, the ordinance was set up before then was design was not to be considered or any kind of aesthetics were not allowed to be considered for the, uh, for the district. Um, I think we quickly learned that uh, four months to uh, do a major text amendment and also develop design guidelines was probably a bit ambitious. Uh, so at the end of the moratorium, we had a pretty good text amendment revamping the DRB, um, and then we said we'd be coming back later with design guidelines. Um, in the interim, we passed, um, you passed uh, a set of design criteria. I think there was about 23 or 24 different uh, individually listed design criteria um, as a <coughs> stopgap measure to make sure something was in the new ordinance. Um, that was in November of 2003. So over the past nine months, we have been working, uh, Michaela mostly has been working very hard on putting together these design guidelines. And uh, they have been reviewed twice by the Historic Preservation Commission for their input. Um, I believe three times by the um, Urbana Plan Commission, who has had a lot of their input. And then we also had an open house um, at Lincoln Square uh, a few months ago where we invited everybody who lives in the district or in the area to come by and take a look at the uh, proposals. Um, so we've reached a point today where we have, um, for your consideration tonight, um, another final text amendment to the uh, zoning ordinance as it pertains to the MOR district. Um, it makes just a couple tweaks from what we approved back in November of 2003, um, but then also replaces the section that addresses design guidelines. It eliminates the, the list of 23 or 24 guidelines that was passed in November 2003, and it instead references this new design guideline booklet to be, um, to be used by the Development Review Board. Um, then again, as I mentioned, there's a couple other tweaks in there also. Um, and then there is the provision to eliminate the section that prohibits uh, parking underneath the structure, um, and those are addressed in the guidelines. Um, again, Michaela's going to go through the guidelines himself, but I, I did want to take the opportunity to, to clarify a little bit how the guidelines are going to be used and administered, and that's been a little bit of confusion over the past couple weeks. Um, they, the guidelines are not simply recommendations given to developers for them to decide if they want to use or not. Um, any new construction or significant exterior remodeling uh, must demonstrate consistency with the guidelines. And um, the way that this consistency is demonstrated is through approval by the Development Review Board. And again, this is a seven member um, board that is uh, or will be appointed probably tonight. Um, and approved by council 
and uh, they are to review these proposals and then decide if um, if the proposals meet the consistency, you know, are generally consistent with the guidelines or not. Um, within the design guidelines themselves, there are, there is flexibility for the development review board. Uh, some design elements are more strongly encouraged than others or discouraged, and there is uh, flexibility built in there for the re review board. Um, <laughs> that uh, staff and the plan commission felt that is necessary considering the different circumstances that proposals will have within the district depending on its location or the type of architecture it's proposing or who's right next door. Uh, it was felt it was important to have a little bit of flexibility over um, you know, exactly what kind of windows need to be uh, used or where, where a balcony may or may not be important. Um, so that's really the... the um, nexus of uh, why we wanted to have the, the, the system of strongly encouraged down to strongly discouraged within the guidelines. But again, compliance with the guidelines is not an option, and that's requirement through the Development Review Board. Um, I love Curtis Pettyjohn's analogy. He always has one when he presents. Uh, I think in the case of the, the guard dog that's been loose without, with, uh, without the teeth, the, the guard dog is really the DRB. And um, we think through the uh, text amendment to the zoning ordinance and these guidelines that they have the teeth that they would need. Um, okay, I'm going to stop there and let Michaela go through the, uh, the book. Thank you. Um, included in your packet is the MOR design guideline booklet that's referenced in the text amendment. Um, there are really about five sections to this booklet. First of all, there's an introduction that speaks to the design guidelines where they apply to some general brief information. Um, it also provides a background of the MOR mixed office residential um, history, where it came from, how it's evolved in the past decade or so. Um, the third portion gives a brief introduction about what the Development Review Board is, what their job is, um, what that board comprises of, and I guess the meat of this booklet would be the nine design guideline topics, which I'd like to summarize briefly. I'll start on page seven with the facade zone, and really the primary purpose of this section is to set up for the DRB um, to identify the facade zone or the important character, characteristics of the site, um, what's seen from the street, on the building, and on the site. So any features on the site, that those being you know, quite important when going through this booklet and through these sections. Um, building orientation on page eight. The main purpose of this section is to talk about different patterns on the block for the DRB to understand that there are predominant patterns on each block, it being unique, um, and hopefully that a building being placed on a site would be compatible with the patterns on that block and how it relates to adjacent um, properties. On page <coughs> nine, there's the massing and scale section. Um, which speaks to the bulk of a structure and how a structure can um, use architectural features to break up the mass and make it more compatible. That sometimes um, it's not how big a structure is, but how it's designed from the street um, that really allows it to blend in with other properties on the block and how important that is. Page 10, openings. This section speaks to the importance of you know, windows and doors on a structure, um, even though that may be basic knowledge sometimes. Um, that doesn't happen. So it encourages adequate amount of openings, obviously, and openings that re respect architectural style of whatever building would be proposed or changes that may be proposed, and, and also talks about rhythms being um, important for openings, windows, and doors on a structure. <coughs> Page 11 um, identifies outdoor living spaces, balconies, porches, or patios. It um, gives a brief definition of what we think of, think of when, and when we <coughs> think of outdoor living space. Um, it speaks to how important front porches and balconies would be in the facade zone on buildings um, within the MOR district. Um, on page 12, the materials section, there aren't necessarily any mandates on specific materials, 
But this section really does give examples of different sort of exterior sightings or materials used in the MOR. There are various materials used. This section really um, speaks to quality and durability being important for exterior siding or materials. The parking area um, section, the main point here is to, although a parking area is obviously important feature on a site, how it's designed and where it's positioned is where we wanted to speak to, really softening the visual impact of um, parking areas or parking garages um, to house vehicles on a site. On page 14, um, we tried our best to identify parking under a principal structure, some examples, <coughs> local examples um, that may be better than other examples that are found locally in our community um, of rear loaded parking for single family um, structures or even in multifamily structures where um, parking in the rear of a lot isn't visible from the facade zone and you know does reduce visual impact of vehicles and, and really makes um, parking areas in the MOR more compatible with other structures and with the character of the district. On page 15, there's the landscaping section, which is also very important for the Green Street corridor um, and Elm Street corridors. Um, and so we thought this was a very important section to include in the design guidelines, um, that landscaping is an important design element, um, as well as preserving mature trees and um, really touching on the visual interest <coughs> of properties and how landscaping can really um, replenish the urban canopy but also help any new structures um, fit in within the MOR district. And last but not least, the commercial site design section. Um, we wanted to <coughs> excuse me, have a, just one section that really hit on some commercial site design features that we thought were important as far as adaptive reuse of existing buildings <coughs> is a very important part of the MOR intent and really the purpose of this district. Um, that new structures would have a residential design and fit in with the MOR. Um, and we hit on some guidelines there that um, the commissions thought were important. And the last part of the booklet really is a photo inventory from July 2004 to help the Development Review Board make their decisions. And we'll take any questions about this booklet. Questions? Shanawath? Just want to verify something as I read through this. It's my understanding that um, the ordinance is mandatory, the design guidelines are certainly um, Strong, you have, you have to, it has to get through the development review board, and there's certain guidelines, um, and that a developer who does not uh, necessarily agree with or like the outcome of the development review board has the right to appeal that to the zoning board of appeals, and the zoning board of appeals decision is final, and does not, it does not go anywhere after that. It's if well. If, is that correct? It doesn't go anywhere within the city. They have the right to um, take the court. Okay. So basically, if the Development Review Board's decision is upheld, then they could choose to drop it or take it to court. And if the Development Review Board's decision is not upheld, then that's a final decision. That's correct. And, and that'd be consistent with, um, say, conditional use permits that are heard by the Zoning Board of Appeals. And if, if they deny something and... and a developer wants to appeal that that would be the, the same process but um, the, the that process of um, appealing a decision of the DRB was carried over from the way the regulations were written for the past nine years or so it wasn't a change we made it was a carry over oh carry over of how the because there hasn't been a development review board so basically a council decision no well there was a development review board except it was five staff members oh, and so staff. if, if they correct. denied a project mm -hmm. and a developer wanted to appeal that their recourse was the zoning board Got it. 
questions for staff? <clears throat> not a motion would be in order. Move Ooh. approval. Second. We have a motion uh, for approval and a second. Any discussion? Um, is, is your motion Oh, uh, I was going to move to um, to delete section two of the ordinance that's referencing the parking issue. Second. So, exactly what is the nature of your motion oh, then? Uh, if you look at, it's the second to last page of the ordinance actually, and there's a strike through in the um, the this, the information we got from staff section two section eight dash three j period location of parking facilities is hereby deleted, and they delete and then it it is a, as a strike through, parking located at ground level below any principal structure shall be prohibited in the M O R district. Parking located underground below a principal structure shall be allowed in the M O R district in accordance with the provisions of Article eight of this ordinance. So my motion is to take this out. That is. And the effect of that, if it passes, would be then to to prohibit parking uh, located at ground level below any principal structure. And <coughs> sorry, I just had, this is not in the law right now. Oh, okay. Um, so it would it basically takes it it puts back in what we've had before uh, up to this point. Does that make sense? Okay. So what? Oh. What you want to do is take out the strikeout and, right, so and, re, uh, and, and retain that um, part that was uh, that has the strike through. Is that what you're saying? Yes. It yes. It it prohibits parking underground under the principal structure in the MLR district. That's that's what my motion is, and that's what was seconded. Okay, we have a motion. Uh, do we all understand what the motion is? Second, does that make sense? Well, yeah. I'd like one clarification, from the staff. I, I think there's an error in this document that was prepared for us because there are two sentences here in strike through, and one of them is not currently part of the ordinance. The, is, the ordinance says parking located at ground level below any principal structure shall be prohibited in the MOR district. That second sentence was one that was proposed by the staff and it was rejected last November. And I don't know why, because the two sentences contradict each other. That's and, correct, yeah. And so, so, so if we were to delete section two of the ordinance as this motion requires that what the ordinance would be left saying would be section 83J, parking located at ground level below a principal structure shall be prohibited in our district, period. Right. And that's the way the law is right now. So those other words just didn't need to be stricken because they're already not there, right? Is that right. correct, Mr. Kowalski? Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> okay, uh, Ms. Chenoweth. I just have a clarifying question. Um, the prohibition on parking under principal structure, does that refer only to new construction in this case, or would it also refer to, say, somebody wants to build <coughs> on top of their existing parking garage? Uh, an apartment. It, um, th the garage is existing and they want to build on top of it. Yeah. I think that would be interpreted as not being permitted. That would not be permitted. Right. Um, well, are okay. you talking about a, a parking deck or are you? Uh, no, I'm speaking of a parking garage that may or may not be attached to a house and whether or not Ms. Wyman's um, motion would prohibit the garage. It's not the principal structure on the lot. It's, yeah, exactly. Right. Oh. Not the principal structure. If it's not the principal lot. structure, then that's. Um, well, that, that, it's a little tricky. Um, if if you have a house and a accessory garage on the lot, and you propose to build a dwelling unit above the garage, which is the case at uh, 102 or 103 <coughs> West Florida mm -hmm. or East Florida, we we looked at that as. Um, a second principal use on the lot and required zoning board approval to do that. So um, we hadn't thought through that scenario, but I guess in, in past practice has been to consider that a second principal use on the lot. So it would. So if, for example, the majority of us said yes to this, to this, uh, you know, prohibition of parking, which is maintaining the prohibition on parking, then that would mean that. 
a second story on top of a accessory garage would be or would not be permitted i would say would not be it would be what it would not be it would not be permitted question thank you the in the mor district since its creation in 1991 parking located at the ground level below a principal structure has been prohibited last november the staff proposed to us that we delete that prohibition and this council rejected that proposal the proposal is before us again tonight and i would encourage folks to again reject that proposal there are three reasons that uh... that i think parking located on the ground level is uh... is not a good idea in the mor district uh... the first was the primary reason that it was included in the original creation of the mor district and that is that the purpose of the mor district is to promote uh... adaptive reuse or new construction that is compatible with the residential character of the mor area and the older structures there in that area uh... and those older structures do not have parking uh... beneath the building or a ground of first floor parking with apartments built above that i don't see how we can allow parking below a principal structure uh... in that area and achieve the compatibility uh... Um, requirement uh... we were originally that or the plan commission was originally presented with a, a photograph of what was thought by our professional staff to be compatible and it was a building where the front entrance was almost six feet above the sidewalk ever on the plan commission agreed that that was not really appropriate and so that picture was thrown out and the pictures you see in the pamphlet uh... that we were given for tonight's meeting are of buildings that have um, a small amount of a parking garage behind the building which is not the same thing as parking located at the ground level particularly if there are no design guidelines and even um, what we would what in past discussions i think we all agreed would be completely unacceptable is only listed as strongly not recommended rather than prohibited in the design guidelines i think that allowing this parking is just an invitation for new construction that is not compatible with the existing uh, properties in, <coughs> in the district and therefore uh... It totally undermines the purpose of mor district uh... the second reason that i don't think parking at ground level is a good idea is because it eliminates accessible apartments there are not very many accessible apartments in this community uh, for a variety of reasons including past actions or inaction by the urbana city government uh... we have this one area where the opportunity for more accessible apartments being included in new construction exists because of the standards that were set for the MOR district in 1991. I don't believe the motivation at the time was to create more apartments that are accessible to people who use wheelchairs, but a good benefit of that requirement has been uh, for the creation of uh, apartments that are accessible. Uh, and uh, it's we're not talking about a great number of apartments either way, but it pretty much is a difference between whether a new building has two accessible rental units or four or six and i would much prefer that we have a policy that is um, promoting accessibility rather than allowing the accessibility requirements to be compromised down to the bare minimum uh... the third reason is and this is something i brought up at the plan commission asking what 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 is why would we want to do this how is the health welfare uh, or safety of the people of urbana promoted by allowing the ground level parking in the new construction in the MOR district and the only answer I was given as to why this would be good would be to increase density uh, now the density increase would be of no significance as far as helping the tax base for the school district I and mean, we're really talking about the difference in, in a lot of cases between whether we have uh, an eight unit apartment building or a ten unit apartment building but considering that the, the changes to the MOR district were brought about by the administration in response to a petition from the people in the neighborhood asking for a reduction in density I find it uh, unsettling that the response we've gotten is a crafty way to slightly increase density uh, if we delete section two and we maintain the status quo which has been the law for 13 years we will 
hopefully see continued development in MOR district that is consistent or, or at least somewhat compatible with the existing structures and the whole difference as far as density and accessibility may be a matter of having an eight unit building with four wheelchair accessible apartments versus a 10 unit building with two wheelchair accessible apartments. <coughs> I don't see that the gain to the public, if any, of having 10 apartments instead of eight outweighs the loss to the public of having only two accessible apartments instead of four or the loss to the neighboring areas of having increased density that puts greater pressure on a neighbor that already is not able to bear the burden of parking that has uh, resulted from, from the new development that has been in that area. So I encourage uh, support for this amendment to the main motion to delete section two from the ordinance that is under consideration tonight. Thank you. Is there any other discussion? Yes, Ms. Wyman. Just briefly, um, I must say that my, the main motivation I have in, in deleting this parking issue comes uh, out of the concern that I think this entire council shares on issues regarding accessibility for people with disabilities. We already know that there is a shortage of housing available for people with disabilities and as the statistics tell us one in five people will become disabled at some point phys physically disabled at some point in their life I think it's important that because of the shortage nationwide as well as in our community for uh, accessible housing that that we not create laws um, to reduce the number of potential uh, homes w that are accessible for people with disabilities um, the other issue, of course, is the compatibility, um, and that's been brought up by uh, by Ms. Pad, I think, by Mr. Ross, uh, who who lives next to a new structure um, for uh, or two new structures in the MOR district. The third issue, I think, that is important in this is, and this is important, I think, in the entire MOR discussion, <laughs> is it goes back to an issue we discussed two weeks ago, I believe it was, uh, in considering whether to allow a house, I believe it was at 505 South Urbana, um, mm -hmm. over in, in Ms. Hooth's ward, um, allowing, w seeing whether that, uh, that structure, that house could be um, torn down in order to have a, um, to put in four apartments. And something that Ms. Chenoweth said, and I think was repeated in an email thanking us for our vote, was that we don't want to contribute or to allow uh, to give an incentive to allow houses or structures to be run down or to be allowed to be run down in order to just get a council approval for to to allow a place to be torn down um, or demolished and turned into uh, an apartment building and I think that the adaptive reuse issue then is important in this issue as well if we allow parking uh, underneath the principal structure I'm concerned that 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 will create an incentive for not the reuse of the structure but instead uh, doing what what happened what it, what appears to have happened um, at Kohler and Green Street on the west side uh, southwest side where we now have an empty lot and that is to just allow the the house to to be run become run down not do the the necessary changes uh, necess necessary fix-ups and then just allow it to become so bad that of course it has to be demolished and I think that um, again taking this issue out taking out the possibility of uh, putting in parking at the ground level where it, uh, underneath the principal structure where I don't believe it exists anywhere in the current MOR district um, I think taking this out would uh, take away that incentive for uh, allowing the property be, to be re run down just for the economic incentive of putting uh, parking on the first floor Thank you. Is there uh, further discussion? Mr. Whalen. <clears throat> I know someone who has a house that's uh, accessible to the handicapped and has not had, and it's for rent, and has not had one application yet from a handicapped person. That is not to say that there are benefits to having a wider use of, uh, of um, availability for people with handicaps, particularly in <clears throat> who need uh, accessibility to wheelchairs. But I think sometimes, I think we're overplaying this, and uh, I, I can't agree. Discussion? 
Just a couple of questions. So, um, Mr. Kowalski, you were saying if uh, if this amendment is uh, approved, then um, an apartment or living unit above a um, garage that is not currently a principal structure on the lot um, would not be allowed. Is that right? Yeah. Once a dwelling unit is added on top of a, um, a detached garage, we consider that a second principal structure on the lot. Mm -hmm. So, and uh, this is a that is a, a scenario that could come up in this uh, MOR. Is that right? In fact, um, we've already had a uh, uh, somebody that's interested in. Uh, constructing a garage with a living unit above that uh, in a way that's compatible with a historic home. Is that right? Yeah. If, if it's not a living unit, if it's not a dwelling unit where somebody's going to live there separate from the, the house, then we would still consider that accessory to the main house. But if it's going to be a, a dwelling unit on so top of it. So if it's a separate garage, dwelling unit, then it's a principal use. If it's auxiliary to the 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 main residence, if it's, um, say, an art studio or something of that nature, or a playroom for the kids, um, then that's going to be okay. But if it's a, um, a self-contained living unit, then that's a, with a kitchen and bathroom and so forth, then that's uh, a different matter. Is that right? Right. right. I see. So that's a, a difference there. So. Just a follow-up question to the mayors. Um, would uh, would a person who would like to do something like that scenario be able to request a variance, or is this something that is not is prohibited outright and and variances on it are not heard? Yeah, it's not really a a variable item such as a five foot setback or a thirty five foot height limit. Um, you know, I suppose an appeal of the requirements of the zoning ordinance could be presented. To the zoning board, uh, I don't know, wouldn't say how, wouldn't want to speculate how successful that would be, but there is really not a, a variable issue. Would um, would this, would the city be able to di to distinguish between, um, not necessarily with this language, but additional language, be able to distinguish between an existing structure and a new structure? So would they be? Would we be able to say, for example, under with existing to encourage adaptive reuse of structures with an existing structure, um, a development above an existing parking uh, garage would be acceptable, but under new construction, something like that would not be acceptable. Is that something that a distinction we could legally make? Yeah, I think so. I mean, the, the ordinance is set up that gives other um, allowances for projects that are adaptive reuse. Um, I don't, Steve's not here, but I don't think that's a, a stretch to allow it in an adaptive reuse project or where there's an existing, you know, accessory structure. It could be set up that way, I suppose. Okay. Other questions? Okay, if not, um, a um, the vote would be in order. All those in favor of this amendment, please signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? No. See a show of hands. Uh, all those in favor, please raise your hand. Four opposed? It's two. Motion carries. Um, back to discussion on the main motion. Uh, Ms. Chenoweth? I'd like to make an amendment, which is... Uh, if council members will look at the memo that I passed out earlier, this is actually a, a revision of a memo that Ms. Pat has been circulating. Um, and the section, actually, if you look at, at section three and below, so the second, the bottom two thirds of that, of the memo, um, basically the proposal is to change design guidelines review Actually, I don't know if I got this. <laughs> they just got one. Okay. Um, to change the paragraph uh, below that and replace it with um, 
Design Guidelines Review, the Development Review Board shall evaluate the design of any proposed new development to determine compatibility with the residential character of the neighborhood, that's Ms. Pat's language, and with the MOR Mixed Office Residential Zoning District Design Guidelines. A a com it should be compatible, not compat <laughs> compatible. A uh, structure shall... Um, one, have a main entrance on the street side of the building. If a lot has more than one street frontage, then the main entrance shall be on the more major frontage. And two, have windows facing each street frontage that are a minimum of 25% of the wall face. And then it ends, and this is again, uh, uh, I think the initial language, uh, it hasn't been changed, but the MOR, uh, guidelines shall be adopted under separate ordinance, shall be housed at the City of Urbana C, uh, Community Development Services Department, and that the proposed amendments shall be considered by the Plan Commission in the form of a public hearing, et cetera. This is, that actually is, uh, there are no additions or, or changes to, to what was in the packet. Um, so that is the motion. Second. Yeah, there's a motion and a second. Um, uh, Ms. Chavez, so it was exactly as exactly as, as written written here in the bold. Yes, in the in the bottom third, all the underlined portions would be would replace uh, section three J of uh, what we received in our packets. Okay, we have a motion and a second. I uh, got a um, on that item two there. I've got a question for staff and. Um, says have windows facing each street front frontage that are a minimum of 25% of the wall face. Um, and I don't have a problem with the concept, but I know that 25% of the wall face when you start adding it up is a large proportion of the wall face. Um, a criteria that I don't believe many of the homes that are in the MOR would meet right now. And so if you take a look at some of the pictures, I'm looking at um, 408 West Green, 406 West Green, uh, that are existing uh, older homes. Um, the windows that are facing the street probably amount to a, a fraction, uh, probably you know closer to 15 uh, percent of the uh, wall face rather than 25. And when you think about it architecturally, 25% uh, is a huge amount of window space. And um, when you talk about the, the separation between the, the, uh, the space between the roof line and the windows and the bottom of the windows to the base to the foundation and so forth, 25% is a huge uh, amount of wall face. And uh, I don't know, Ms. Chenoweth, if that's uh, where that number came from, but uh, I, I think if we're making it a requirement that every house in the MOR ought to uh, comply with it currently, and I don't think that's the case. Journalist. I can answer your question, which is where it came from is actually the existing ordinance. It came from the in the existing ordinance, which has been in effect. If you look at, and I have just far too many pieces of paper in front of me right now, um, page 10 of the, of, the, of the ordinance that's before us tonight, you'll see a number of strikeouts, and it's actually kind of the last page of the ordinance that's before us. If you turn, turn it all the way over... Um, You'll Excuse see. Me. It's the last page of the memo just prior to the ordinance. Memo. Oh, that's yeah. correct. The memo prior to the ordinance. So page 10, it is quoting from the ordinance. And in that, in the ordinance, uh, design guidelines review, number five, letter J, says a minimum of 25% and a maximum of 60% of wall face to be windows. So the 25% came from that. Now, I think staff would need to ask where that or need to, to answer where where that okay. particular language came from but that has been <laughs> but that has been in um, in effect uh, since we last looked at this issue well I know that that uh, those were added at the last minute um, uh, staff had uh, at the time requested we just leave that uh, as a holding place for the guidelines uh, council uh, wanted to have something in there until we got the guidelines, uh, and so it was just a last-minute addition by council where that 25% came from. I don't know, but it, uh, I don't believe it came from staff. There was a list that the Historic Preservation Commission had put together um, as a general recommendation for what to consider with design guidelines. Um, for the most part, that list was used for that 23 design criteria, but 
the mayor is correct, on the floor there was a lot of revision, and I don't recall if those percentages were originally on that historic preservation list or if that was something that was added by council. But I can say it isn't anything that staff has done any kind of research or survey on to find out roughly what percentage of wall faces are covered with window in the MOR or anything like that. Well, I can do just a visual. I mean, there are a number of these houses that do not meet that criteria right now, and I think it would be a mistake to have a percentage that high in there. What the correct percentage would be, I don't know, but that is a large, that's a high percentage. Yes, Mr. Whalen? You know, that uncertainty can arise because of committees designing buildings. I think in anything like this, it's a wise, a good idea for staff to review this thoroughly, and I would propose to table this presently and move it to our next committee meeting so that the staff will have a time, a chance to look at this and come back with a better understanding of the problem. So I make a motion to move this to committee meeting next. Second. Your motion is to send this to committee next week? Yes. Okay, we have a motion and a second. Is there any discussion? Could I, I don't know if I'll get a friendly amendment out of this, but as a friendly amendment, I'd like to ask Mr. Whalen to consider adding two things to your motion. Number one is to specifically state that we would like staff to come back with language to address adaptive reuse of existing parking structures that would allow for building on top of existing parking structures. So to propose some kind of language to address that. And then number two would be for them to come back with a recommendation about, because I believe there is a consensus that we need to have windows that face street frontages and that's not taken care of as an obligation in the design guidelines, to come back with a recommendation for a requirement that would go in the ordinance that would stipulate a certain amount of windowage, so to speak. So those would be the two, so that we give them a little bit more specific direction on those two items. That's very wise and I think it reflects the debate tonight. I would accept that as a friendly amendment. Okay. There's a motion and a second. Any discussion? Yes, Ms. Wyman. Just a clarification. It seemed like Mr. Whalen had a question or maybe other members of the council had a question as to where the 25% issue of window frontage came from. If you recall the November 13, 2003 letter that was in your packets, well, back in November when we addressed this issue sent by Ms. Pat and I, on the suggestions there was item K, a minimum of 25% and a maximum of 60% of wall face to be windows. So that wasn't something that was amended on the floor, though Mr. Kowalski is correct that we did have a lot of discussion and changes on the floor. And I believe that the proposals that we put in the packet in that letter were from the Historic Preservation Commission or Historic Preservation packets that discussed these issues. So I don't know if that was indeed a question that you all had or if I'm just dwelling on detail, but to the extent that answers that. Thank you. Yeah. The point is regardless of where the 25% came from, I don't believe it's consistent with existing buildings that are in the MOR, and I would hate to see that as a required guideline when many of the buildings in the MOR would currently be noncompliant. I'd like to withdraw my motion, not the motion to table or to send to committee, but the initial motion that I made just so it's clear what motions are on the table and what aren't. Point of order. The motion to table was to table that motion. The motion to postpone consideration is to postpone consideration of the main motion and the motion to amend. So we have to act on that first. Yeah. 
So if anyone wants to withdraw anything, you have to kill Mr. Whalen's motion. It's Mr. Whalen's motion. So you can't withdraw Mr. Whalen's motion. I believe there's a motion on the floor. Motion on the floor. For the entire package. And then there's a motion on the floor for the amendment. And there's a motion to send it to committee, send the whole thing to committee. Okay. And what we're discussing right now is the motion to send it to committee. Okay. Yes. So if it's the council's desire, we can do that. I don't think we're all that far from getting this done right now, but if you'd like to send it to committee, that's fine. Anybody, any further discussion on the motion to send it to committee? If there's no more discussion, all those in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. Opposed? I will see that next week then. Next is the guidelines themselves. Let's see, where are we on this? An ordinance approving design guidelines, the MOR Mixed Office Residential Zoning District Design Guidelines, Plan Case Number 1897-T-04. Was there any further presentation on those? Does the presentation include that? Okay. And I don't know if you want to move and discuss these at this point. General Wirtz? I move. Oh, we're speaking of the design guidelines? Yes. Never mind. I'm on to the next thing already. I thought we were done with MOR, but. Ms. Pratt? I move to send this ordinance to committee with the previous ordinance because the one is dependent upon the other. Second. I was just wondering if you want to discuss any potential changes here or so that we can be more prepared for next week. Does anybody have any? Without acting on the first one, we don't know all the potential changes we would want to make because. Well, but there may be some changes we want to make regardless. All right. That could be. Sure. Is there any input that council can help to give the staff to make next week more productive regarding the guidelines? I think one of the things that I'll be suggesting at least at the next meeting to give council members and staff a heads up is in the proposals on the design guidelines is that all of the items that are strongly recommended or strongly discouraged on pages 7 through 14, that is all but the landscaping and commercial, be put into not be changed to not just strongly encouraged or strongly discouraged but prohibited. And I'd be happy to put in council members' packets language to that effect. But if the mayor is just asking and staff for an idea of what we want to do and to give staff a heads up, that's one of the ideas I have. Thank you. Would you state that again? Sure. If you look at the packet that we went through and that is actually a beautiful design and shows a lot of great things that we want to see protected or duplicated in the MOR district, if you look at starting on page 7, the facade zone, you'll notice that there are items, three bullet points, strongly encouraged, one bullet point, strongly discouraged. If you look on the following page, page 8, building orientation and patterns, two items, strongly encouraged. I understand that. What was the nature of your motion? The motion that I plan to make is that those items that are listed here as strongly encouraged, I will make a motion at the next meeting that those be changed to required. And those items on pages 7 through 14 that are listed as strongly discouraged, I will make a motion to make those that are prohibited. Does that make sense? That makes sense. Okay. In formal discussion, I certainly, that's a direction that we'd like to go. I think the way the staff and the plan commission have this laid out with strongly encouraged, encouraged, and so forth, will give the guidance to the design review board who will have the ability to decide whether the specific site plan and design is compatible with the neighborhood. I think you can, and when you make such requirements, then you take the 
uh, flexibility away from the design review board. And uh, then you, you uh, even if all of those things are requirements and a, an architect and a, a builder adhere to all those, you can still have an ugly building that doesn't fit in with the neighborhood. And um, I, I think that that just sends the wrong message to uh, people that I want to develop in the area. Other guidance for staff, Ms. Pat? So just <clears throat> following up on that point, I think that, well, first of all, the number one goal here should not be um, flexibility for the Development Review Board. It should be to accomplish the purpose of the district and the Development Review Board carries out one function in relation to that. And, and they, but they would not be without purpose if, if the mayor's point was that if we required, if we had design guidelines, that then they would have no purpose. You know, that's not really true. We have guidelines right now. We have all sorts of guidelines under the zoning ordinance. The purpose of the Development Review Board is to evaluate those things which are not um, easy, well, that are not easily either a mandate or a prohibition and, um, and to make some of the judgments that uh, might be subjective. Uh, and some of, and if you look at all of these, I, I agree with the general sentiments that uh, Ms. Wyman uh, expressed, although <coughs> if you go through these page by page, you'll see that some of the, the uh, strongly encouraged guidelines are not subjective and would be easy to mandate, such as main entrance located on the front facade of a building, which was in fact part of Ms. Chenoweth's motion. Uh, and um, one that was not part of Ms. Chenoweth's motion, though I would like to see as a requirement, is the height to width ratio of a structure is compatible with that of other structures on the block. That could be a requirement. The Development Review Board will still determine how, how much it has to be two to one, one to three, whether or not it's appropriate, but the, the, but the requirement is that there be a height to width ratio um, evaluation. That's something that's not required right now. Uh, some of the others, I mean, there's some things that don't lend themselves as well to requirement like um, uh, openings that reflect the building's architectural style. I think that would be a hard thing to mandate, and I think that's better as, as a guideline. Um, uh, front porches and balconies with roof lines that are compatible with the main roof of the structure. And if you just look through some of these, you'll see that I, I think there's a mix under, what it, under the strongly encouraged of uh, points that could be and what appropriately would be mandated and those which should remain guidelines. So. Um, and I, and I think that our staff could have come up with that had that been the, the administration's direction. But since the decision was made uh, after the council voted on this last November to initiate a plan case to get rid of that, I don't think anyone ever looked at that. So if you have the desire to keep some things subjective and, and evaluated by the Development Review Board, but uh, uh, are willing to concede that there are some things that are easy to mandate and appropriate to do so between now and the committee meeting. Uh, you, the mayor may want to ask the staff to have a look at those strongly, those bold points under strongly encouraged on each page and see if there are some that you want to recommend be mandates as opposed to mere guidelines. Other direction for staff for next week? All right, well then, um, if there's no objection, we'll see this uh, next week at the committee meeting. Let's see. Item 8 under um, new business is an ordinance authorizing the chief administrative officer to execute a tentative agreement regarding the Stratford project. Uh, Mr. Walden? Uh, what you have before you is a little bit unusual uh, in that it's a agreement to proceed reason that I felt we needed to do this is that we're running out of time on this construction season. We came to agreement on Wednesday, Thursday morning. We have this before you in the packet Thursday afternoon. With, with these assurances, the developer will begin. In two weeks, you'll have before you the final development agreement, although, I, although we do have an agreement on the terms of that. So those are outlined. You know, if you look at any development agreement, there's the city obligations and the developer obligations. Those are outlined here. Um, so we are going to proceed, and the developer is going to proceed on the assurances that we make tonight. The final agreement will be before you in uh, two weeks for execution. Uh, entertain questions on the development. Questions? 
Not a motion would be in order. Move it. Move. Second. We have a motion and a second. Any discussion? Yes, Ms. Wyman. Let's get the hard hats out. I'm ready to dig. <laughs> <laughs> this is a Ms. great General. project. Yeah, I couldn't be. Some harder than that. Yeah, I couldn't <laughs> be exactly the corn sign for the work. Um, I couldn't be more thrilled. Uh, I completely applaud the city administration. I've met with uh, Joe Petrie a dozen times on numerous issues, this one being one of them. Um, I applaud uh, both he and Ray Timponi. Unfortunately, they're, they're not here to hear it, but I certainly will be giving them a call. Um, the, you know, unlike other communities like our, like our nearest neighbor, but many communities, they have lots of infrastructure that's in a decayed state in their downtown. We have a small amount of in infrastructure, partly thanks to a number of fires that happened in downtown a while ago. And many of the pieces of infrastructure in our downtown, the buildings, are in great shape because uh, whether people like this or not, there are oftentimes quite a few attorneys who purchase their buildings and keep those buildings in, in very good shape. Um, and I, I think that what we need to do is build, we've needed to build for a long time. We have to build new structures. Um, as a business owner in downtown and as somebody who uh, is constantly speaking with other businesses and uh, talking to them about the benefits of downtown Urbana, one of the things that I have found as a recruiter for downtown is that they can't find spaces for what they want to do. There's, there are tech companies, there are cafes, there are all kinds of groups that I've spoken to, I know our staff has spoken to, where they need lots of different kinds of spaces in which to, to uh, start their businesses, grow their businesses, expand, etc. The city has some things, there's a few things in disrepair that are available, otherwise it's very limited in terms of the kinds of spaces. So we absolutely need to do something like this. Um, and we, uh, I know that we talk about a, a lack of business in our downtown, and I think the piece that, that has been missing in that conversation publicly at least, I think the city has talked about it, is that we have to build new to do that. Um, so. Uh, I think that this is a local developer. I know we were looking at a Chicago developer before. I think that's great. I think we need a local developer who knows the heart and soul of our community, um, is in, in touch with that. And I think that every piece of this proposal that I've seen so far is right. Uh, it's mixed use. It's large scale. It's adding significantly, um, possibly in the 80 to 90 houses of accessible housing, which is something that we've had in a kind of our long-term vision for a while. And, haven't been able to make that happen. Um, and so I say go for it. Okay, any other discussion? Yes, Mr. Whalen. What uh, Ms. Chenoweth has said, I think it's wonderful that these, local, these guys are doing this. But I also would uh, compliment our staff, our mayor and our chief administrative officer for uh, bringing this to fruition and aiding and assisting in it. It's a, it takes a great team and the council. So well, that's wonderful. Okay, thank you. Any uh, other discussion, Ms. Huth? Uh, just to say I fully support this project. I've been asked on numerous occasions um, what's going to be going up on that site over the years. So I'm glad to be able to, to talk about this exciting project. And I also know there's a demand for housing in and around the downtown area. And I'm looking forward to um, us being able to meet that demand. And, or to bring more people living in the area. Okay. Any other discussion? There's no other discussion. Will the clerk please call the roll? Alder Persons Chenoweth? Yes. Hayes? Yes. Huth? Yes. Pat? Yes. Whalen? Yes. Wyman? Yes. Mayor Satterthwaite? Yes. That motion carries with seven eyes. Uh, next, Let's see if I can find. Uh, Appointment of the assistant chief. All right. Um, no, I've got it. Um, the uh, appointment of assistant uh, police chief. It's um, my pleasure to submit to you uh, the appointment of Mike Beely to the position of a assistant chief of police. Uh, Mr. Beely has uh, 22 years of progressive law enforcement experience, including nine years of proven leadership as an Urbana lieutenant. Uh, he's, well, you can see on his resume and uh, paragraph here, he's got a lot of managerial, technical, personal skills, has a Bachelor of Science, 
uh, degree in law enforcement administration from Western Illinois University, uh, 2,200 hours of law enforcement training. Um, well, I worked with Mr. Beely the entire time I've been mayor and think very highly of him and so uh, very happy to um, submit his name uh, to you for confirmation to uh, as assistant chief of police. So moved. Second. We have a motion a second. Any discussion? Yes, Mr. Whalen. Just to say that I think that Officer Beely, Assistant Chief Beely, is a fine officer in our on our staff. We can be very proud of his professionalism. I've seen him in service, and uh, I'm uh, very happy to see for your wishes. In your okay, thank you. Any other discussion? There's no other discussion. All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. Aye. Opposed? That motion carries. And finally tonight, uh, appointments to the Design Review Board. We've been talking about the uh, Design Review Board um, for much of the night. And uh, it was mentioned that uh, one of the two major changes was the makeup of the board itself from five staff members uh, with a um, unanimous vote required from those uh, five staff members to a seven-member uh, board uh, whose members are um, <clears throat> detailed or that the requirements are uh, detailed in the uh, zoning ordinance. Um, and that uh, any design needs to that was reviewed by the design review board requires a two-thirds majority vote uh, for approval. So that's uh, five out of the seven members. I'm pleased to present to you uh, six of the seven uh, spots on the design review board. Uh, the seventh uh, is not on your list, but. Uh, uh, she has accepted, and I'll present that to you at the next council meeting. Uh, she is in the audience uh, right now, uh, Betsy Cronin. Betsy, you'll raise uh, your hand so council members know who you are, and she would be the uh, final, um, uh, if she's approved, the final uh, member of the DRB uh, filling the resident uh, or resident within 250 feet of the DRB. Uh, so I'll present these uh, six who have agreed to serve. Uh, Art Zangro, uh, 702 West Oregon, and uh, he would be the uh, representative from the Historic Preservation Commission. Uh, Lori Gosha, 612 West Iowa, uh, she would be the representative from the Plan Commission. Uh, Jennifer Gentry, 2104 South Vine Street. Uh, Ms. Gentry uh, is a partner in Better Image Digital Photo Lab. Uh, she's Chief Financial Officer at Squad Fitters in Urbana, is a tax accountant, and also owns and manages uh, apartment buildings in Urbana, uh, one of which is on Green Street in the MOR. And she would be the small business representative on the DRB. Um, Christopher Hartman of 905 South McKinley and Champaign. Uh, Mr. Hartman is a real estate developer with JSM Development. Um, he received his industrial and manufacturing bachelor's of engineering from Northwestern in 1999. Um, he is, as I said, with JSM, who um, just recently had an open house at the uh, Gregory Place uh, building on campus. Uh, he would be the uh, developer representative on the DRB. Um, fifth is um, Mr. Brian Adams of 412 West Elm. Uh, Mr. Adams is an archaeologist at the University of Illinois, uh, received his bachelor's and master's degree from the U of I Chicago and his PhD from the U of I in Ur Urbana-Champaign. And he would be the MOR resident representative on the DRB. And uh, Brian has uh, made it through the entire meeting tonight uh, <laughs> and is in the back row there. Uh, <laughs> right, it's a show of his commitment. Um, sixth is Michael McCulley, uh, 2354A County Road, 1100 East in Champaign. Uh, Mr. McCulley is an architect whose present occupation is Associate Dean in the College of Fine and Applied Arts at the U of I. Uh, he's active in many uh, professional organizations, including State of Illinois Architecture Licensing Board. Uh, he was part of the... Uh, MOR committee uh, several years ago and also owns a house which I did, was not aware of uh, until after he accepted his appointment. He owns a house on Elm Street uh, in the MOR and he would be the architect representative on the DRB. And so it's my pleasure to present uh, those six to you this evening and as I said I'll have uh, Betsy Cronin's 
name before you at the next council meeting. I'll answer any questions at this point. No questions. Motion would be in order. Move approval. Second. A motion is second. Any discussion? Yes. Ms. Pat? Just two little corrections. The name of the body in the ordinance is actually Development Review Board, even though their goal is to evaluate designs. Excuse me. And Mr. Zongaro lives on Michigan, not on Oregon. Well, I was... Which you know since you live in Oregon. Yeah. I must have been thinking of my own home there. Yeah. Sorry about that. A little typo. Okay. Yes. Ms. Wyman? I just wanted to point out, I don't know if other council members had thought about this, because we had also been working with the ethics ordinance and last week talked about conflicts of interest. I asked Mr. Holtz before the meeting if the fact that some members of the Development Review Board lived in the district and obviously would be affected or feel affected by changes, if that would create any sort of conflict of interest. And he said that, no, the fact that members of the Development Review Board either live in the district or own property in the district would not create, by them voting on any of these things, any conflict of interest that would violate the proposed ordinance. And that in and of itself. I mean, there may be conflicts of interest otherwise, but not exempt from conflicts of interest, but this doesn't necessarily create a conflict of interest. Correct. Okay. All right. Any other discussion? If there's no other discussion, all those in favor, please signify by saying aye. Aye. Opposed? That motion carries. And there being no further business to come before us.